and we're recording. Great, thank you, uh, Gary. I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate the uh, um, the council coming back on tonight, as well, of course, the uh, the board of ed. Uh, while it's not the close confines of the town manager's conference room like we've been doing uh, over the last couple of years, uh, I do appreciate you guys logging in from home and uh, and being with us tonight. Um, first, I'd like to uh, convene the special meeting for May 13th. Uh, this meeting, I believe, is our final workshop meeting. We've had department heads uh, for the last two board, uh, workshop meetings tonight is to, uh, to hear from the, um, the Board of Ed. Uh, and I do appreciate the uh, presentation that was made uh, last Monday by uh, Mr. Emmett and, uh, and Chairman um, Chuck Carey. Uh, this is kind of a, a follow-up to that and uh, we're hopeful, hopeful that uh, some questions will be asked and some answers will be given that uh, get us closer to the uh, um, final budget decision coming up in uh, a little over uh, a week and a half. Uh, but before I do that, I do want to um, give an opportunity to uh, Councilman uh, Brooks Parker for a, a quick point of personal privilege. Uh, I believe I saw Councilman Parker on earlier. Uh, if he is here, yes, he is. Um, I would like to, uh, you know, ask you to, yeah, I, I know you had reached out to me. You wanted to make a couple comments uh, at tonight's workshop. Um, so please do, the, the floor is yours. Actually, Brooks, you got a no sound coming from you. Nope. Now? Yep, sounds good now. Okay, thank you, Mayor Rell. Sorry about that. Um, it's very soft. Tonight, I am offering a forthright apology to the members of the Weathersfield Town Council, town staff, especially Town Manager Gary Evans, and Human Resources Manager Stephanie Asplund, and the residents of Weathersfield for my actions and what was set off microphone this past Monday night. I want to assure everyone that I take my responsibilities as a councilman seriously. Since being sworn in, I have attended every council meeting, as well as many town committee meetings, some of which are scheduled during my normal working hours. Unfortunately, this is a very difficult period for all of us. I made comments that were wholly inappropriate and disrespectful to council members and the residents of the town. For that, I am truly sorry and my most sincere apologies. Budget discussions are difficult. This year, they are much more difficult than normal. We as council members have to balance the requests and needs of the town as an organization against the needs of the town residents and business owners in light of very challenging economic conditions. Nearly 20% of our friends and neighbors across Connecticut are currently unemployed. An equal number, if not more, have been directly and negatively impacted by this pandemic. I have participated by listening and asking questions when appropriate throughout the budget process and will continue to do so until we, as a council, finalize a budget that takes the various concerns of the town and its stakeholders as a whole into consideration to produce a responsible and effective budget for the upcoming fiscal year. Again, I want to offer a genuine and sincere apology to everyone and look forward to continued conversation on developing a town budget that will work for everyone in the town. Thank you very much for listening, Mayor Rell. Thank you, Brooks. Uh, I appreciate your apology. Um, we are living in a uh, very difficult time right now. Uh, there are a number of concerns that are weighing on our, uh, our minds almost daily. Uh, when I wake up in the morning and when I go to bed at night, not only am I thinking about my loved ones and my family, but I'm, I'm truly thinking about the Weathersfield residents and, and the decisions that we are making as a whole, not only for us on the council, but the Board of Ed and all members of the public who are serving on boards and commissions. Uh, as I said, this is a difficult and, and different time. We are no longer able to have meetings in public where we are viewed by the public. They see all of our actions 
Uh, they see our responses and they see our expressions. Uh, let me just give this a, a, an opportunity for everybody. You know, most of the people that I'm looking at on the screen right now have served in one way or another in the past, uh, but there are some that have uh, only just uh, this year uh, started to serve the public. Uh, the public has entrusted us uh, to make the decisions to be the eyes and ears for them uh, as it pertains to the issues that are at hand in the, um, uh, and the issues that are, are, are going before us. We, we need to take our role seriously. Uh, we need to look at what is being presented, weigh the options, and know that what decisions we make or don't make affect everybody in this town. Uh, we cannot sit idly by, nor can we, you know, uh, have quips and quick comments and, and jokes or, or even, you know, our, our personal feelings put out there um, in a, a public display without the, the full gravitas of what we are saying and how it would affect the, uh, the residents of our town. Um, with that said, I, I would like to encourage not only the council, but you know, the board as well as any um, boards and commissions that meet via uh, a virtual uh, a platform like Zoom to, uh, to keep your, your cameras on. And uh, if you can, you know, mute yourself uh, when possible, just so that there isn't the background noise, but people need to know that uh, their representatives on the council, on the Board of Ed, on various boards and commissions are listening intently, hearing and uh, absorbing everything that is said uh, from the public, for that is uh, the sole reason that we were, uh, we chose to, to run and serve, and uh, I believe that uh, we have to give our undivided attention to to those that are uh, are um, asking of us to serve on their behalf. So um, I thank you guys all again for serving, for coming out tonight, listening and and being part of the uh, the dialogue uh, as it pertains to the town and and to the to the residents of uh, of Weathersfield. So um, without further ado, uh, I will ask. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Chairman Kerry, if you've got any, you know, opening remarks that you want to say, uh, if you're going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Emmett and to, uh, to Matt Kazaka, the finance director, uh, I'll leave that up to you. Otherwise, um, you know, we do have the, the budget in front of us and uh, you guys, you know, can have the floor and uh, please, you know, start off with the uh, with what we were seeing for a budget and uh, you know maybe some of the trends that we'll be seeing in the next couple of weeks as it pertains to uh, to the budget or Board of Ed budget. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you for having us here tonight. I will turn it over to Mr. Kazaka and Mr. Emmett and they will begin. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Uh, my camera is currently not working, so I will just give a brief overview, then I'm going to log off briefly, reboot, and that should get my camera back up and running. So uh, just as a means of refreshing everyone's memory, uh, our approved 2019-2020 budget was $55,759,339, and we have proposed for the 2021 school year a budget of $57,713,537. This represents an increase of $1,954,198, a percentage increase of 3.50%. Um, we started our budget process actually in late November, which is the earliest that we've ever started it. Uh, we went through a series of budget workshops uh, that were open to the public, and I appreciate those town council members who were able to attend those meetings. Um, we have made adjustments. We saw a couple of increases uh, during the budget process. Those uh, increases uh, were an adjustment to medical and dental insurance, which increased our budget uh, by 125000 we also had a contractual obligation uh, for degree changes for the Weathersfield Federation of Teachers. That was an additional 60,000. 
That took us up from a 3.66% increase to 3.99. Then we worked on budget reductions prior to the approval of the uh, board approved budget. We reduced 67,000 in the IT department for supplies. We eliminated a nurse tutor position for a student that is aging out. We reduced uh, a graduating outplay student, 85,000. We uh, anticipated additional choice revenue, 25,000. We reduced instructional supplies by 67,000, which took our total reduction to this point down to 269,000. And there we are at the 3.50% increase. Um, as Mayor Rell talked about in difficult times, it certainly is difficult times. There's no two ways about it. Um, this budget was crafted just prior to the COVID pandemic really taking effect and taking a hold in Connecticut. As a matter of fact, this budget was unanimously approved by the Board of Education uh, just a couple of days before we had to make the difficult decision to close. Um, obviously, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has had an impact on our operations uh, and our most precious resource, and that's our kids. I am extraordinarily proud of how our district, our teachers, our administrators, our parents, and our students have adapted to this changing landscape. In the span of 24 hours, we allocated 1,100 Chromebooks from classrooms to dining rooms, to living rooms, to bedrooms, so that kids could access learning. We developed a distance learning plan that we have implemented and works to this day. We know full well now that the school year is over as we know it. And frankly, I must be very real with you. I don't know what summer looks like. I don't know what the fall looks like. The idea of normalcy, we don't know what the new normal is going to be. So right now we're awaiting guidance from the state with regard to what summer school looks like. As you know, we budget each year for an extended school year program for our students with special needs. Uh, in addition to that, we house the YMCA uh, summer camp program. We're hoping to make that run. The YMCA has submitted an application to the Office for Early Childhood to uh, attempt to run a program this summer at Hanmer. But frankly, we don't know. We don't know if there are going to be restrictions to class size in the fall. We don't know if there are going to be restrictions to the number of students that can ride on a bus. We don't know if we'll be able to run a normal day. This budget, I feel, is lean. I feel the, the majority of this budget takes into account contractual obligations. It contains no new programs. It contains no new staff members. We recognize where the mill rate is. We recognize that we are in difficult economic times. We also recognize that we have an obligation to our children in Weathersfield to provide them with the best possible education. So with that, I am uh, uh, happy to take any questions. We have Matt Kazaka with us. He is our business manager. He's been with the district for four years at this point in time. So he has been through this process before. Uh, and be happy to uh, answer any questions. If we are unable to answer any questions, we will certainly uh, get the answers to you. Uh, as I would imagine, we'll probably be uh, breaking this down line by line. So with that being said, I am going to log off briefly and reboot and get back on so that you can actually see me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Appreciate that. Um, and right thank back. you for being, being here as well. Um, I will, uh, before I ask any questions, obviously, I'll, I'll open it up to the floor uh, for anybody who's got some questions. Uh, and it goes both ways. So for those um, on the Board of Ed, if you've got any questions or concerns for uh, the council as well, please voice those. Um, I believe whenever we sat in on these workshops in the past uh, in the town manager's conference room, we've tried to have everybody uh, engaged in an in a open dialogue so that we can be on the same page when it comes uh, time to, to uh, agree on a budget in, uh, in the coming weeks. So um, with that said, does anybody have any questions for uh, Matt? Amy? Hi, Matt. I have a question that I, I think you can answer. Um, when we were going through the town budget, we saw that there's a new position in the town budget 
uh, for a person that will, that is scheduling um, building usage at, at the schools. Uh, and I just want to verify that that position has been removed from your budget now that it's on our side. Correct. It was never in our December draft or the Board of Ed approved budget. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and will you be talking a little bit about um, some of the savings you've seen from March or that you anticipate from March to the end of the year? And also, will you talk about some of the additional expenses you've had with distance learning? I know a lot of, I know you're paying all the salaries and you're paying your contracts, um, but the two areas I was thinking about were spring sports um, there must be some savings because you haven't had all of your spring sports. And then the other question was with um, substitutes. Are you paying, do you have to pay Kelly sub if we're not um, having any subs working for the district? So I was looking at those two areas in particular, but I'm sure there are other areas where there were line item savings. And then if you could also talk to the additional expenses that have come about because of the distance learning. Sure. At this time, we have uh, some Kelly long-term subs who we are still paying. It's about $10,000 per week. Our last finance committee meeting, we had a REAP forecast through the end of June that has a savings of about $371,000. And that is prior to any transportation savings. So we are negotiating with our in-town provider to determine what percentage we will pay without any service at this time. On the coaching stipends, there is an MOU with the WFT, the teachers union, where we are paying 25% of the total spring stipend. So that's a savings of about 100,000 and that is built into the 371 total. As so, far as expenses, they're well, minimal just, at this point. We have, we have some PPE, some masks, some thermometers that we purchased, but in the aggregate, we're at about $5,000, maybe a little bit more. So just, just to clarify, you said there's a 300, right now you see about a $371,000 savings and that includes the, the coaching, all the spring sports savings and the Kelly sub savings, or is that every, everything soup to nuts you that's, see that's, about that's everything excluding transportation. We're still in negotiation with okay. the transportation provider. Okay. Mirelle, can I ask a follow-up on transportation? Sure. I think some people have read or, or heard that, you know, we're obligated for the transportation, yet some of the drivers themselves are laid off. What, what assurances do you have if we are indeed going to pay, you know, a significant portion of the transportation contract that that, that money will indeed actually go to, to drivers? Yeah, we have a contract amendment that's essentially legalese that ties into the original contract that states that the drivers will be brought back in employment, whatever the effective date is, and paid their salary and wages. Okay. Um, just a, a follow-up to one of those. I, I see it, Kevin. Just a follow-up. I Was it for the coaching stipend for the teachers? Was it twenty five thousand realized, or twenty? Did you say a twenty five percent or twenty five thousand? We're paying twenty five percent savings is approximately a hundred thousand. Twenty five percent savings equals a hundred thousand. Okay. No, Mike, um, Mr. L, we're we're paying them twenty five percent of their stipend, saving us a hundred thousand. So typically, their stipend would then be four hundred thousand dollars. Matt, right? Correct. To the total. While we're on that, just so people know, within the MOU, they are doing work with their student athletes. And even though there was no spring sports, we all know coaches are preparing before the season. So they did work before the before the COVID shutdown as well. Just so we know that they're not, the stipend was is well deserved. Not to mention the fact that CIAC ruled that virtual coaching can take place and has also allowed that even to happen in fall sports. Yes, yeah. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, that will begin in, 
they can do some coaching in June and then virtual coaching for fall sports starting August, mid August, mid to late August. Okay. So the total aggregate for spring sports is about 135,000. So we're saving the 75%, which is a hundred thousand. Okay. Saving a hundred thousand. Got it. 75% is the hundred. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, you had uh, your hand up. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mayor. Uh, Matt, question on, on, the, on the savings for the health insurance side. Um, with Mike O'Neill on the town side, uh, we've, the town's saved, uh, at least in the short term, a tremendous amount of money because no one can really go out to do anything elective or anything, um, like go to the dentist or their, or their uh, regular routine visit. Um, is that included in any of your savings? Because, you know, I only ask because if, if you're including that in savings, like eventually people are going to go back out, uh, you know, to, to do, uh, go to the doctor, go to the dentist, that sort of thing. So is it actually realized savings if we build into our budget? So Mr. O'Neill may be better to answer that, but what we budget for health insurance, we expend the full amount that goes over to the town self-insurance fund. So if there is any realized savings, perhaps it stays in the fund balance. Okay. And, and regarding um, any federal dollars that may have come down, have we realized anything from the CARES Act that's come down from the federal government? We had a number that came through today, but we don't know the timing of that. Okay. At this point in time, Kevin, uh, just to build on that, uh, the state is working on an application to LEAs and has started on the planning process and asked districts to start on the planning process with that. Um, so with that, they're talking about utilization. They have it pretty much earmarked where it'll be utilization for enhancement of technology. Uh, it will be utilization uh, for supports for students, uh, utilization for curricular enhancements, um, and then utilization for social emotional supports as well. Pretty much the four the components that I spoke of last week at the budget presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I have, a, I have a quick follow up about the, the CARES Act money. So you said you had a number come down today and that it's earmarked, but what is that number? Approximately 274,000. Oh, okay. And that's one part more of the, I'm sorry, that's part of the 111 million that was earmarked for the state of Connecticut. Yes, yeah, so, so, so your the weather shield is getting 274,000? That's correct, that's the number we received today. Great. Um, I also had a question about Chromebooks that are in the proposed budget. It's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that some of the Chromebooks that were budgeted or that are contained in the proposed budget were purchased or leased using money in the current year budget. Is that correct? That is correct. Absolutely. We requested board uh, approval. Given the mm -hmm. fact that we were in the midst of the pandemic, we were concerned over the supply of Chromebooks, um, given the fact that districts across the country were scrambling to purchase them. Um, we also had the unenviable task of having a large number of our Chromebooks that are ending with their lease life, lifespan. Uh, and we did not want to get to a point, especially knowing we may have to do distance learning even into the fall, where we were short uh, machines. So we went before the board, the board approved that. Uh, we'll be making two lease payments out of this year's current budget. In addition to that, uh, the lease quote, uh, we originally had budgeted, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, I believe it was 160000 Correct. And the quote did come in lower. The quote came in, I believe, at approximately 133000 Correct. So there are some savings there. So that's 160000 in the proposed budget that for the, the Chromebooks that you do, will not need. Is that correct? No, I'll clarify that essentially all we're doing is starting the lease two months early rather than July 1st, we're starting in May. So we still have 12 months of payments in next fiscal year. The reason the board of ed approved the lease early is because of the inventory shortage. Okay. Okay. So there's not savings or just a couple months or savings or I'm just yeah, trying we'll, to figure out. We'll call it 160 is budgeted. If we say it's 133 is the actual. So you have a savings of 27. Okay, 
And that's not in the 371,000 number you mentioned? No, that's, th that's this current year financials. We're looking at 2021 budget. Right, right. Okay, yeah, 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 got it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mr. Emmett, do you have um, retirements this year? Will we see any um, savings from that category? Yeah, we at this point in time, we anticipate, uh, I believe it's four retirements. Um, there was one that we were hearing was gonna happen, but until I get a letter, uh, it's just conjecture at this point in time. Uh, Matt, what did we project in terms of savings within the budget? We had at the time the budget was done, we had three retirements, but one individual was paid out of a federal grant. So within the operating budget, there's only two, and we uh, took a credit or a savings of twenty thousand per individual, so forty thousand total. Okay. Uh, were these retirements um, classroom teachers? that uh, I believe yes one is a classroom and one is a kindergarten a special ed yes um, yes kindergarten and special ed okay Mike Tom yeah, just a little follow up on the retirements. So isn't it typical that the person retiring would be at the top of the pay scale and then you would hire in someone towards the bottom of the pay scale? I'm questioning why, why only the 20,000 savings? It's going to depend upon the position that we're looking for, um, Tom. What's going to end up happening in certain cases with regard to special education, for example, those are specialized areas. So the idea of being able to bring somebody in at bachelor step one is not as high as it would be in a classroom setting. Um, there are typically times in other cases where if I was going to hire somebody that has a license like a speech clinician, um, I'm not going to be anywhere close to the bachelor step one because those folks have to have a master's coming in. The vast majority of, of staff members we have coming in are coming in at the master's level. A lot of kids now, what they'll do is they'll do the master's and bachelor's program together. So they're already starting at a higher, higher rate. Um, classroom teachers tend to be a little bit easier uh, because of the fact that there are many more of them. We have other areas where like some of our world language, um, we struggle mightily with finding any uh, candidate. And usually what you end up getting is you get a candidate that wants to, uh, is experienced, is in another district, and wants to come to Weathersfield. So you'd be hiring that person at a higher rate. And, and these three retirements that we we know about are all these more specialized positions. Is that true? One one is not. One is a classroom teacher. The other two are more specialized. Okay. Um, Mike, will any of these positions leave holes in the curriculum like the French teacher did last year? Well, we, we had to think outside the box with the French teacher because we didn't end up actually getting one. That was one of those tough positions. So we actually, rather than finding a French teacher, we found a Spanish teacher and then looked to shift the French classes over to one of our existing staff members that was teaching dual, both Spanish and French. So we took Spanish away from him, moved Spanish to the new hire, and then he took over the French classes. So... We had, to, we had to be creative on that one. But do you, you don't anticipate any of those issues with these retirements? Uh, with the classroom teacher, no. With the special ed teachers, yes. Okay. Matt, Forrest, I saw your hand earlier. I just wanted to. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm using a little hand. Uh, little hand button here it seems to be pretty orderly um, <clears throat> I was curious about the transportation contract and how it works as if they're obviously if the buses are not running but it seems like we might be obligated because we have to pay some of the salaries and with the PPP program which is covering the salaries over the next two months which is when we have school I'm wondering is and I don't know this 
is there a possibility that there's sort of a double dip by the bus company whereby we could maybe pull back some of our funds that we need to expend if the federal government is essentially floating their boat for all of their contracts? I can't answer that directly. What I have heard is that anecdotally from one of the transportation companies, an individual in the front office was brought back from unemployment and was a little irritated because they ended up making less back on the payroll than from the collection. But I cannot tell you exactly what is happening. The breakdown we have from our one provider who we settled with, they do uh, state that all employees are back on the payroll and they break out wages and fixed costs and we are capped at 80% per month of the total cost. So I guess, right, and, and I don't know it might be interesting to look at if they're getting PPP funds, which it sounds like they are, which could be very substantial. Do we have an obligation if the federal government is stepping in to essentially pay our way to keep all these people employed? I don't know the answer, but it, it may very well be so. I don't know if it's just a derives a windfall to the company or if there's some type of a clawback that we can use in order to not pay those funds because as we talked about, the federal government may be paying them. Seems something that we could look into. It might be a significant amount of money. I don't know that any of that is necessarily true, but it does seem to meet the windfall scenario. I think it's probably the right way to put it. I'm just looking here to here and see if we can, you know, save a few dollars in order to make it a little easier on us and continue good educational programming. Mm -hmm. Okay, make a note of that. Brooks. Thank you, Mike. Um, I had two children go through Charles Wright. My son would have been graduating uh, shortly. And he did spend his fourth year in fourth grade in the, in the, um, the, the modules, the portables. Chuck, maybe this is for you or, or Matt or Superintendent Emmett, but can you speak to, I know the elementary schools need a substantial investment in the infrastructure. Um, which I think is something we we need to consider sooner rather than later. And I just wonder if you could speak briefly to to what that's looking like based on some of your your research and due diligence um, and how we might weigh those those costs in in future budgets. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to speak to that. We have uh, portables at two of our locations right now, uh, both at Highcrest Elementary School as well as Charles Wright. Uh, these portables date back to the very early 2000s. I think Charles Wright, for example, they were put in around 2001. Um, the condition of the portables in terms of which is more dire, Highcrest Elementary School is absolutely more dire. They absolutely have to be addressed. We've gone through a process where we've gone out to bid twice. Um, I know that physical services brought in an architect to, to plan out a design uh, for the removal of the units and the replacement of the units. And we've gone out two separate years. We've had a grand total of three bids in two years, and all three bids have been well over the budgeted amount. With Charles Wright, Charles Wright has not gotten to the point yet where they are in dire need of replacement. Um, definitely Highcrest is the more pressing at this point in time. We had a significant water intrusion and long time water intrusion over at Highcrest. Um, they actually replaced the roofs, um, but in the process of replacing the roofs, we had a significant amount of water in those units and they really got to the point where they were no longer usable. Um, at this point in time, I might propose knowing full well that the uh, manufacturing companies aren't even producing these at this point in time, that perhaps we look from within uh, I know that there is money in capital improvement that has been uh, earmarked for the portables at Highcrest specifically. And, you know, perhaps it's something along the lines of doing a tear down, down to the studs. I can tell you right now, the subfloor absolutely has to be replaced. It's been waterlogged. You've got in, uh, insulation and drywall that needs to be replaced. You've got the strong solid footing there. Uh, you know, and if we could do something like this in house, I think it could be a money saver and it opens up desperately needed space at Highcrest. We're, we're north of 450 kids in, in that school. You know, folks have said, well, why don't you just redistrict? Redistricting is a domino effect. And in my 
professional opinion is better served as part of a long range building plan, which you know, you know, we've embarked on, we've done a lot of data and we understand right now with the current ec you know, economic conditions, it's, we've had to put a pause on it. But um, for Highcrest specifically, Brooks, we've got to absolutely make sure those get done. Charles Wright, we've got a little more time, but again, in capital improvement, I know Sally Katz had put that in as, as a potential for down the road. Thank you. I just, despite the reality of the pandemic, I think you guys should keep moving forward with that so that we can know what these costs are gonna be. I think we need to invest in the elementary school buildings throughout town um, to better the district. And as you know, as time marches on, things get more expensive. So let us work on that in the coming year and really take a look at what kind of those costs look like. And I know you've had a plan to use the uh, high crest schools swing space while you, while you attend to other buildings. I, I would just, I would hate to lose that and just see it get so astronomically expensive that we're, our hands are tied. So please continue with that effort. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for that. I was going to comment about uh, the high crest um, portables and I know, I think Matt, you or Mike, you've uh, heard from me in the past and I know Gary Evans is as well about my concern about um, the classroom sizes at High Crest, you know, we've heard about it for a number of years and, and that would be a priority. That is probably my number one priority um, for, uh, for you guys. Um, hopefully, you know, shorter than later, it would be taken care of uh, and worked on. Um, glad to know that it, uh, it is a priority. Do you guys know the, uh, census are coming in for next year are we uh, expected to have a similar size kindergarten class at high crest right now with the projections and it's tough to make a projection given the pandemic uh, we're not seeing a typical number of kindergarten registrations that we normally would at this point in time uh, right now uh, we're preliminarily uh, projecting three classrooms for kindergarten but again those four kindergarten classrooms all move up to first grade Right. So we're looking at a very stable enrollment, Mike, for next, uh, for next year. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Did anybody else have any questions? Can I, can I follow up on the, um, the portables? Um, is Mike O'Neill on the call? I don't see him on my screen. I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, what, I don't know if, if it's a question for you or for Gary. What, how much do we have right now in capital improvements for the portables? This is, is this one of those accounts where every year we're putting in 50000 or 40000 or is this just what's in the budget this year? No, it's, there's already some funding there. I'll, I'll see if I can look that up right now for you. But yeah, I'd like that. to I know. I don't have that at the top of my head. I, yeah, that's okay. I, want, to, I want to say it was two. 25 last year we put 50 in CIP this year with another 25 earmarked because we were trying to get to 300 but Mike if you could just confirm that so you think we had 225 and then this current fiscal fiscal year we put another 50 and so we're up to 275 is what you gonna, think might be in that account now we're going to find out okay because at, at our meeting when we had Sally um Katz director of physical services she did talk about this yeah, um, and and, and yeah. talked about using town staff to do a rebuild. So I'm glad to hear that this is something that the Board of Ed is supportive of as well. I know everybody would like brand new portables, but if they're just so astronomically expensive, if we can do, a, a, you know, a build like new in those portables, I think that's great. Um, and then, Mike, you touched on enrollment projections, but just for Highcrest, how do you look district wide? You know, you've got 277 seniors graduating. Um, what's kind of a projection of, of next year versus this year? Yeah, Amy, we continue to look very stable. Um, you know, we did our, uh, as part of our long range planning, uh, Malone McBroom did a, a 10 year study uh, and the projections look remarkably stable over the next 10 years. I know uh, Patrick Gallagher, who did the study, remarked that it was one of the most stable um, town assessments he'd ever done. 
Um, so, you know, we definitely do see some fluctuation here and there. Obviously, the economic conditions may adjust our numbers. There's no two ways about that. Um, but we have been remarkably stable over the past uh, five years, and we expect the next 10 years. I think this is the last year where the kindergarten numbers will be flat. And again, they were due to be flat this year, and Highcrest defied that. And it's interesting because we find that it tends to be year in and year out, and that's usually where we get into class size issues. So in the last three years, this year I dealt with Highcrest Kindergarten. Uh, then there was a year where we dealt with Charles Wright. Um, then there was a year where we had a huge bubble at Emerson that we had to address. So it's difficult to predict, um, you know, and even this year at Silas Dean, we had at the beginning of the school year, we had an additional 30 seventh graders come in from other districts, something we didn't see. So it, it, seventh grade this year has been packed. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I say something about the portables? It's Elaine. Can anybody hear me? We sure can, Elaine. Okay. Um, I went to, I visited um, Highcrest before the um, shutdown and everything. This, the uh, principal doesn't even have an office over there, just to make you people aware that she's in a, a room where kids do physical therapy. Uh, she's got a little desk in there. It's so and I hate to use this word, but it's so unprofessional if she needs a parent conference with somebody. There's all kinds of um, equipment for the physical therapist around. She's got this little desk. She has no chair. Uh, uh, so it's just something I think we really need to focus on the portables um, classrooms over there. And, and Mike Emmett has done an excellent job trying to get that done. And I agree with him that if we can do it in-house, more the better but i just wanted to share my thoughts on that thank you thank you elaine um i can tell you at least from my perspective i i hear you loud and clear on that and if we can do that in-house um we're working on it i think i've had a number of conversations with the town manager on that we're we're trying to figure it out and work on it as best we can um that is a goal of ours uh, Anybody else with any, Tom? Uh, Kevin was first. Oh, sorry, Kevin. Appreciate that, thank you. Um, so Matt, regarding the, the savings of the 370,000 you said from this year? Yes. And with the 274,000 we're getting from, well, hopefully from, from the feds or from the CARE Act, um, I know it's not an apples to apples budget thing that you can just plot, move it over, but does, you know, that's a little over one, 1 1.2% of, of, of the budget. Does that mean that the administrator, the BOE's budget request would, is going to be redu reduced by that amount that instead of asking for the 3.5 uh, or 3.6, that it's now a 2.6 or 2.5? I think it would depend on the details of the CARES funding and how we can use that, if that can be used dollar for dollar directly to what we have budgeted for 2021 as far as um, technology or whatever the requirements are, then that's potential. And then whatever savings we have this year, if it's agreed upon, we can use that to offset 2021 health insurance. Then in theory, we could, you know, that could be a potential. In terms of like, in terms of actual budgeting, though, do you need the money to flow that way? Like, do you still, would you still need to budget for that amount and then offset it? Or can you under budget and then have it carry over? On the insurance side, we did this a few years ago where we reduce our health insurance line and then the savings at the end of this fiscal year rolls forward to the town side and goes to the self-insurance fund. So that would help directly on that, that component. Okay, thank you. And like I said, I, we just need to do a little more research on the care. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanna make a comment about the portable classrooms at Highcrest. Uh, <clears throat> there seems to be some misunderstanding by some of the uh, parents of students, uh, particularly Highcrest, that 
the town uh, is fully supporting the replacement of the high crest portables and that it comes out of the town budget, not the board of ed budget. Uh, some of the comments are such that um, there's a concern that the board of ed budget is being reduced and they will not get portables. And that's not the case. So it's a uh, top priority on the capital improvements list. It has been for a few years. And as uh, Mr. Emmett explained, the, the bids came in almost twice of what the architect anticipated and what we had budgeted for. So uh, we're working as best we can to get those portables, uh, at least at high crest, corrected over the summer. And, and uh, our goal is to get them ready for, uh, for fall school if it, if it in fact starts in the fall. So I just wanna clarify that it's not something that comes out of the Board of Ed, three and a half percent increase. Right. Uh, I don't know if Mike O'Neill is back with the, the figures from the CIP that we've put forward for the last two or three years. No, not yet. Okay, no problem. I'm just I, And I'm, Gary, I think I'm trying to wreck my brain as well. And I was looking through my notes. You're right, 225, 25, and then we're trying to make it whole to 300,000, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that, that, that was the, the plan. And just for the Board of Ed members, and um, I can't remember, it was in the first, Sally was in the first group that presented, but we are, and for uh, the residents who might be tuning in and listening tonight, specifically for the Board of Ed, and I thank Deputy um, Mayor uh, Mazzarella for actually bringing that up. The town has been working on a plan uh, to try to renovate those, to make them as new, um, and look at other options. And I think uh, Superintendent, uh, Emmett did mention that COVID-19, all the modulars are shut down regardless of the cost. Um, that second set of bids came in extremely high. And so we are looking for opportunities to do it in-house. Uh, there are a number of obstacles related to it, but we have to ensure things like structural integrity of the building, um, safety, meeting fire codes, meeting new building codes, um, because it is for the protection uh, of children. Um, so we are looking at those opportunities um, and it is on the town side budget, and uh, it is definitely a priority. I've gotten I've gotten the the, the comments from council um, to make it a priority. Yes. Yep. I'm just looking. CIP funds allocated to date 225, and then I think we were looking at 25, and then an additional 50. Uh, what was not included was portables at Charles Wright. They had a projected cost of 150000 a request for seventy five. I don't believe that was in this year's um, CIP request. Okay. Um, so if, if I might just follow up on that. Uh, I participated in the uh, capital improvements um, committee and the uh, consensus was to try and pick projects that we could knowingly complete within the next year rather than put money away little bits at a time and basically not utilize that money until we uh, collect enough to get something done. So the idea was to more towards picking a few projects that we could actually complete and turn over to the residents. So that's why that Portable classroom took the priority. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I had a couple questions about um, MBR. The any savings or any CARE Act funds, any additional funds that are coming in, does that offset MBR requirements at all? That I don't know. We'll have to do some research. Along those same lines, ECS funding, uh, what are we looking at for an increase over FY20 to FY21? Is there an increase in ECS funding? I believe there is. Let me see if I can find it quickly. 
632. Not, not far off. That's the increase, yeah. Okay. Um, I know it's too early to tell, but is there any, um, would there be any concern for a mid-year revision at all for that, a possible cut in ECS funding? Had, have we seen that in the past? Um, yeah, we had uh, one year where we had ECS uh, mid-year cuts. I understood though, and I could be wrong on this, but wasn't there legislation that uh, eliminated that practice? I'd have to check on that to make sure. But we did face that once, absolutely. Okay. And I'm not hearing, I was on the governor's uh, municipal call just prior to, uh, you know, one of the uh, governor's budget directors talked about the fact that the state with the rainy day fund is okay through fiscal 21. Beyond that, we, we don't know. Obviously the revenues have gone down. There's no doubt about that, given the pandemic. Exactly, yeah. And that's where budgeting right now in the, the midst of a pandemic where we actually, we can't rely on a mid-year budget like the state does right now to be able to, you know, continue expenses as they are, um, you know, trying to, to forecast out the next 12 months during right now. Uh, I know at least on the town side, it's difficult. And I, I can only imagine hearing about, you know, spring sports right now, the, the questioning of fall sports, transportation in the future, all that is up in the air uh, right now. Um, I did have, you know, along those lines, I did have a question about, now it's going through the back of the budget for you guys, some of the, the travel expenses, seminar expenses, and any of those, um, you know, outside the, the typical um, functionality of the, the Board of Ed budget are are we realizing any savings over the last uh, 90 days or so for any out of town or out of state conference travel would that be realized at all that's a question that i'll have to get back to you on mike um the only out of state travel we have typically approved would be grant funded like it would have been paid out through the perkins grant um we as a district have been rather stingy about uh, out of state uh, conferences. Uh, we've pared back significantly given the fact that that was an area that we reduced. Uh, for example, we were going to send a group out uh, to California for power school training uh, and that was a cut last year. So that didn't happen. Um, and again, even myself, the only conference I've been to uh, is the New England Association of School Superintendents on which I am a delegate uh, and that uh, I traveled up to New Hampshire for a few days. So we've been really limited in terms of any uh, travel for staff. Would, and I know it's, it's a big if, you know, not knowing what's going on tomorrow, let alone, you know, September, are, if any large gatherings are still prevented and conferences are prevented uh, from being, you know, having taken place, would there be um, obviously some savings from virtual, attending some of these virtually, um, would that be something you guys would consider and then maybe shift some of those savings to other expenses? Yeah, I mean, certainly that's a, a, a doable thing. Um, I would caution that there's not a lot in the budget that's related to conferences. You know, a lot of what we do, Mike, is, is around, like for example, you know, on May 4th and 5th, we were due to have our NEASC visit where they were gonna come in and, and help us with our self-study. That's obviously been canceled. NEASC provides a variety of different webinars, which our staff members um, have access to. Those are free. So any, any opportunity we can get where it is a, a free um, uh, experience, we will do that. Um, right now, at this point in time, I can tell you that obviously there are no requests for uh, any conferences at this point. Uh, for next year, if we're tight on the budget, we're going to eliminate it. I mean, that's the whole piece. Right now, if somebody wants to go to a conference, it has to be approved through us. And we were at the point, knowing this year and the current budget prior to the pandemic, we were already saying no, because the money was tight. 
And one of the areas that we typically cut right up front so we don't have to get to staff levels, we cut instructional supplies, we cut professional development. You know, some years back we eliminated our connection with CABE and, and a money saving effort. So um, there is potential for savings, but it will not be significant. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Anybody else with any questions? Well, Mary. Sorry, um, Matt. Mary and then Matt. Um, so, uh, Superintendent, you, you touched on this um, in your intro. I know you don't know what's going to happen with summer school and this may not the fall. And I know a decision on the fall may not even come until mid August. But summer is right around the corner. And this year, since we don't have to pass our budget until June 15th, when do you expect to know more about summer school? And what would the impact be on the budget if you had to do it virtually versus if you could do it in person you know, at web or wherever you normally hold it? Yeah, thank you for the question. I uh, expect to have more guidelines coming from the state on Friday. May 15th, we were told, my most recent phone call with uh, Commissioner Miguel Cardona uh, talked about Friday being the date. Um, obviously, there are legal ramifications with regard to extended school year. I have an obligation under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act to provide a free and appropriate public education. Um, in the event that we had to maintain a virtual experience, I would still be paying a cadre of special education teachers uh, speech clinicians, paraprofessionals who support the uh, learning uh, of the individualized education plan, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists. Um, again, we don't know if we'll be able to deliver those services in-house or not. Um, obviously, transportation um, is a potential savings uh, if we are not coming back in uh, to web where we house this program. So there is potential savings there. But in terms of staffing, the expectation would be that we would run a program virtually using our technology, much like we're doing now. Thank you, Mike. Matt? Thanks, Mayor. Uh, this is maybe directed at Matt Kazaka, but, and I was picking up on some of the nice questions that Kevin Hill mentioned. There's obviously, and there always is since our last, since the, when you present the budget, there's adjustments as we move through this two month process. I don't necessarily understand, I understand that some of the movement is, but what is the current number? And Chuck will probably be able to, Mr. Carey, <laughs> I called him Mr. Carey in a long time. Uh, Chuck would be able to tell us, is the Board of Education asking for a different number now because of those recent adjustments? And if so, what is the current number that we're looking at? And I don't, the percentage thing is just a percentage of a percentage. What's the number of dollars? Because at the end of the day, we, we allocate dollars, not percentages. Is that, is that an accurate statement even? I, I don't even know that that's accurate, but. Well, I don't think we adjust our request, right? Our request is official as of m March, whatever. So, I mean, are you asking for like, I mean, Mr. Kazak has already said 370000 plus whatever we negotiate with bus contracts are going to be hopefully realized savings. But I, I think it's hard to quantify that into like where it would be as a request, right? Our request stands at 3.5%. If you're saying if savings help us bring that down, it could and keep our status quo budget for sure. But Matt spoke of that, right? Matt, 370 plus whatever we can get from the buses. Correct, and we have another finance committee meeting in two weeks, so we'll do an analysis over the next however many business days and then report out to the finance subcommittee and then that'll be public information. But the services are gonna be the same with the realized savings. And so what would that number be as a request in order to maintain exactly the services that you had, but realizing the different situation and these savings? Well, any savings from this year, is it agreed upon that it will offset the 2021 budget? Well, it would, it would head into the town. It would head into the town coffers, which we could then use, I suppose. Or it can go to the 2% reserve. Okay. So we're saying that this money at the town council's discretion can be taken in as revenue at the end of this fiscal year and then reapplied to your request. 
but the actual requested amount of money doesn't change because at all to keep the same level of services it doesn't affect the level of services going forward in the next fiscal year it just right. merely changes the amount of revenue that the town's going to realize when you guys close your books at the end of this fiscal year right we would still have a three and a half percent increase covering the services but the effective increase percentage would be less because we're using this year's savings to reduce that number and that would be our decision to use those savings but it doesn't reduce the number of the requests though right it just simply we realize new revenue in the next fiscal year which we could use to offset but the request is still exactly the same i'm just making sure i understand this right but your allocation to us would change so you we've requested 1.9 million and okay. if you pay the 500,000, the 370 plus whatever savings, I'm going to say 500 because it's an even number. If the, you say the 500,000 can be used towards our budget, then your allocation would be 1.4 million, not 1.9 million, knowing that you're then going to fund the 500,000 to cover what we want. But it, then your allocation would still only be 1.4 million, not 1.9. So then the request would be 1.9, and but do because because we would put this into the insurance fund, so we were able to roll that over, because normally we can't roll that over. Is well, that the administrative procedure? It. I know I've been, I've, I'm on some conversations where towns have made agreements with the Board of Ed, like uh, like an understanding, like one time, use this money towards next year's budget. I've, I have read those do occur. And that'd be a discussion of Michael and uh, Gary. And I was always my understanding that at the end of the year, under our charter though, those extra monies were required to sweep into the town and the allocation, and then we would have to just allocate back. Is that not true, Gary? And that you can't, there's no, these, the deals that Mr. Carey is talking about, it's not really, unless it's done through maybe a specific account, but not like, hey, keep the money until next year, we'll just allocate less. Like that, that according to our charter, that's not really a thing. I was but gonna say, I, I, think it, I think it lapses uh, but I'd have to go back and look at the charter on the the way the appropriation occurs. It happened a couple of years ago where the board was overfunded, had excess funds, right? And then used it the following year. I believe yeah, it was expensive. Okay. Half a million dollars as well. Yeah. It's oh, already man. happened, Matt, while you're on the board. But did we put those into one of those special accounts that can lapse over? Is that my understanding that that's the vehicle that's used? Matt, how did you do it? That would be for Mr. O'Neill. We had just agreed that it would reduce our subsequent year's health insurance costs on the, the board budget. If I Mike, may. Is that, is that because it went through the health insurance uh, commingled funds, I guess you might say? Let's, let's take a step back here. The medical fund is a non-lapsing fund. Right. Just it's, it exists on its own separate from the general fund. Um, every year, the board and the town budget a contribution to the medical fund, which approximates what we expect the cost, the real cost of the program to be. Um, but sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. We don't put extra money in if claims are higher. That's what the that's what the self insurance fund is for. It has a reserve of its own, and it, it absorbs any overages and claims, and we carry over any you know if we're under on claims any surplus. It's all recognized. So it's just a a straight contribution by the town and the board into the fund. So what we can do is when we decide on what the number is for the board. For fiscal 21, if there's funds available from fiscal 20 that can satisfy part of that contribution for 21, that contribution can be made in 20, and thus reducing the contribution that's made in 21, the payment in 21, but we still carry that number. So to go to try to use some real numbers as an example, pretend, let's pretend that we need to put a million, the board needs to put a million dollars into the medical fund in fiscal 21. And you've got a hundred thousand left over from fiscal 20. You could put a hundred thousand in, 
this year and then reduce the amount that's in your budget for 21 from 1 million to 900,000. You still, the cash, we've still moved a million dollars of cash into the medical fund for fiscal 21. You just did part of it in fiscal 20. And you just said, the thing we have to remember is the starting point for the 22 budget is a million. It's not nine, it's not 900,000. Right. So it's the, it's the medical fund that's used as the non-lapsing fund in order to move from one fiscal year to another. You got it. It's clever, Mike. I give you credit for that one. <laughs> I, I didn't come up with okay. it. Okay. So that, so then we would reduce the allocation specifically in the medical fund. So the 1.9, assuming this 500,000 is here, would move down to 1.4. Still would be funded at the regular levels. You know, we would still be funding everything at the levels that are requested, but the allocation would be reduced 500,000. Is that generally accurate? You're splitting, so now, you're splitting your contribution between two years. But the, okay. but the, medical, the medical fund is whole once you've made the, the payment in 21. And would that be a vote by the town council in order to do that? Or would that be at the same time as the adoption of the budget? Would that be a separate sort of, you know, we have to have those six or seven items that we vote on in every budget time? I believe you would approve it by virtue of uh, approving the, the appropriation to the board for 21, knowing that there was an understanding between the parties that some of the required contribution to the medical fund for 21 was going to be made from surplus funds in 20. I mean, you really can't, because you can't, you can't touch the board's appropriation um, for 20. And right. you can't, uh, once you've made the appropriation for 21, you can't touch it. So it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, you're not making a specific, you're not approving that specific transaction. It's just, you approve the, 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 the appropriation in total. But then we agree, we also agree as a town that we are not gonna receive the $500,000 as a lapsing fund because they would have put the money into this health account. Right. All right. But there's nothing so, legally, there's nothing legally binding. It's just a, it's just good faith. <clears throat> okay. So if that happened then, um, uh, Chuck, if the 1.9 was the original request, we, we could have this type of an agreement. And then the board would be, assuming that that was true, the board would then be looking for 1.4 to equal the same services that you guys budgeted for. Is that generally true? That's what I understood from his explanation, yes. Okay. So have you guys, um, it, it has been discussed. I talked to the town manager about reductions from the 1.9. Have you guys discussed what uh, scenarios would be would look like if there were reductions in your budget and, and what kind of effect that would have so that we could make thoughtful, obviously you control the money, but we're trying to make thoughtful discussions about what level that is and, and your advice and so what your intentions are would be very helpful. We, we have not had those discussions so the, I know in the past, we've done a lot of those what-if scenarios. And the board leadership just felt that uh, Mr. M. and Mr. Kazaka had a lot on their plate right now with this pandemic, figuring out graduation, figuring out summer school, this and that, that coming up with what-if scenarios would be taken away from things that are real life and what's happening during the pandemic. So there has been no scenarios created. I mean, it's pretty evident if you sat through the workshops that 3.5 is a pretty lean number. There's not a lot of room to wiggle in that number. So to give you scenarios would be hard to, you know, sit down and tell you exactly what would have to be cut. I mean, I think it's favorable that we're going to save, you know, 370 plus thousand dollars and hopefully you guys let us roll it over, but we don't have any what if scenarios created. So from our perspective though, it seems pretty, it's kind of difficult. I mean, we could certainly just take the number, but there are members of this council, which we've had conversations that are looking at significant reductions in the expenditures. I'm not gonna go out and talk about rumors, but it's true, it's happened. So how are we supposed to gauge what the effect on our education is as we look through those cuts? 
without talking directly to you, the, the leaders of our educational, of, of education, to understand if, if, this board, if this council considers whatever it is, right, and I'll use a small number, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, we, we need to know what kind of effect that's gonna have in order to make a wise decision. How do we get that information so we understand what that, what that looks like? Well, when you're looking at an increase of 3.5%, uh, Matt K, can you tell me uh, how much of that 3.5% is contractual obligations? Sure. Let me get to my page. Um, I can tell you that salary and benefits are 94% of that increase. So 1.8 million out of that 1.95 are salary and benefits. So that's, I, I'm, I'm getting to staff very quickly. And it's not doom and gloom. It's not trying to be, you know, sound the alarm. That's just the reality of it. I don't have any new programs that I can cut. I don't have any new staff that I've requested that I can cut. You know, I, I lost staff last year. I have a very lean administrative team at this point in time. You know, even our positions where we've created positions, we, the creation of positions has, have come at the expense of other positions. So let me give you an example. So over the past four years, we've added ELL teachers. We haven't requested additional funding in a budget to do that. We've reallocated tutor dollars. We've decreased the hours for our tutors so that we can get those ELL teachers. So, you know, we're thinking outside the box and we're trying to be um, as innovative as we can. But, and understand, as I let off tonight, I've already talked about the fact to get down to 3.5, I've already taken a reduction in IT supplies, I've already taken a reduction in instructional supplies. I've taken a reduction in tutoring, uh, or the nurse tutor, which is a position. I've taken a reduction in tuition. And you know well, as well as I do, that special education is the absolute wild card when it comes to how many tuitions are coming in, who's coming, who's going. So th there is precious little room. The other piece with the $371,000 in savings I know some of my predecessors were adamant about spend every single dollar and you know don't give the town anything back. We have operated in good faith, knowing full well the uh, economic constraints. And we've been very transparent with where our budget is at. Earlier in the year, I would say in November, and again, again correct me if I'm wrong, Matt Kazaka, we were running a deficit with our special ed numbers. And now we've seen that turn around with the COVID pandemic and with additional uh, saving measures and some changes in tuition. Um, we're, we're willing to, to provide money back to the town to provide support, but you have to understand there is very little wiggle room here. We're getting into staff. So, I mean, I'm understanding that and there's a lot of intimations, but when we, at, as the, at the council level, and we've seen, we've seen the budget, there's a lot of intimations. What happens if this council starts to talk about seriously cuts? I, I think it's a, very, it's a very fair question. Like, let's just be real. I'm not throwing doom and gloom out there. What happens if we start looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars in cuts? Or so that we can have that conversation to decide whether or not that's a prudent step or not a prudent step. There's only the people that are on this call right now are the people that can answer that question. The leadership of the Board of Education politically and the leadership of the Board of Education professionally. What happens when this council, which is seriously considering cuts, I'm not necessarily doing that. There are people up here. We're going to talk about it in, in the next 25 days. We're going to talk about how to handle that, the current economic situation, and how much can we afford. So tell us what happens when we start having these conversations. Hey, Matt, I, I, don't, I don't think just to kind of address that, I, I, don't, I don't want to say you're incorrect. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's a fair question to ask, especially when I hear from residents where they've had to take a 20 to 25 percent salary reduction at work just to keep their job. And they ask me, OK, I'll pay more in taxes, but what's that going to? And none of it is going to enhance the, the student experience in the school system. I mean, I think it's a fair question to ask. Or, why, or even to reflect the fact that people might be upset where we're giving out contractual raises. I understand they're contractual, but when they have to take a, a, salary, in, a salary cut and all of a sudden their taxes go up, I think it's, it's a fair 
it's a fair question to ask. All right. Well, I'm I'm asking it. <laughs> what ha what happens when? when yeah, and along uh, those lines, uh, Pat. Along those lines, in order to get to no increase, we have to we would we would have to find over almost a four million dollar savings. Um, so we, you know, you're 1.9 on the Board of Ed side. We do need to know what kind of cuts that would um, that would require. And if if and I'm not advocating for it. And I'm not advocating for cutting staff. I've got kids in the Wethersfield Public School System. They're getting a great education. I want them to continue to get a great education. But if that's the consensus of councils that we're looking for a million dollar cut or a $1.9 million, $1 million cut, what are we cutting? If we're not cutting staff, what are we cutting instead? Um, and that's why it is a good exercise, I think, to, to ask for what do the cuts look like at 500,000? What do they look like at a million? What do they look like at 1.5 million? What do they look at 250,000? I, I think it's great that we've had this conversation that there may in fact be 500,000 in play. The, the 270 for the CARES Act, the 370 um, that we can put into the uh, health account. I think that's wonderful. You're talking about, you know, probably about $500,000. So what does the next 500 cut look like? Um, if, if in fact that's what council decides is appropriate. But again, I see I even the bottom line is you allocate our funds and we decide how to spend it. So your decision of allocation is understand that the, the budget we put forward was lean and is exactly what we need to, to continue status quo. Back to Pat, Patrick's point, yes, 1.5 million of the 1.9 is salaries and benefits increase. So using that logic, we can figure out either we're gonna, if we're getting cut big, then there's gonna be staff layoffs. I don't think I need to have Mr. Emmett or Mr. Kazaka sit and create what, how many of each because we can get creative if we have to, but the bottom line is for any cuts below the 3.5 minus whatever we're gonna save will be probably staff layoffs. And I don't see why we have to give direct scenarios of what that would look like. Look back at what last year's doom and gloom was given out. And I find it ironic that two people speaking of this have already publicly said they support my 3.5% budget. So I appreciate that from the two of you. So. The question coming from the people who support all my, giving us our monies is ironic. Well, no, Chuck, it's, it's, exactly, uh, it's exactly appropriate. I think Matthew and I want to know if leadership on the council decides to cut a million dollars, I want to know what that looks like. I'm invested in the school system and I want to see what a million dollar cut looks like. It doesn't have to be staff. You could eliminate some program or some something else and we don't have that information right now and I think we'd want to be transparent about what possible cuts are so that I can decide whether or not I think something is appropriate or not and I do support I think your budget is appropriate right now but if when I get into deliberations with the town council next week I, I would like to see what cuts look like at different levels when we start discussing it and we're asking the town manager for the same scenarios. You know, what does it look like? What are the possible cuts that would be at different budgeting levels so that we have a good idea, we get it. I, I want to be able to get it before I vote on something. And I feel like right now, picture. So May of 2019. We don't, we don't, we don't, Ms. Chuck, we don't make these decisions on council because like we come up with a number in in thin air that we don't understand what the realities of the needs are of the educational system don't say oh we just like pull a number out of a hat we do it thoughtfully and to do it thoughtfully we have to understand the needs of the town and also the needs of the education and what's the effect of the decision that we're going to make and you guys you can't hide the effect and say well we'll make up the cut at half a million dollars or something like that we'll see what they do with it Let's have an adult conversation amongst the leadership to understand the ramifications of the decisions that we make. That is the only question here. You don't, and you guys get to decide. There's no doom and gloom here. You wanna make it undo and doom and gloom, that's great. And I'm not saying it is doom and gloom, but let's just have a real conversation about what the effects of the decision is. That's it. And, and 
And if, you, if you're telling us that staff, we're looking at every time you go 100,000 down, it's a 1.5 or 1.3 FTE, and that's going directly to classroom teachers, okay, we will make the adult decision that this is what the tax rate is, this is what we think we can afford, and we know the consequences. That's it. So again, I'm asking the leadership, this is the only time that you are on this call, we're gonna be deliberating the next 20 days. What is the effect of cuts to the $1.4 million, assuming that the sweep of the 500,000 is kept to you? This is, got a question. This is, this is Elaine. Right ahead, Elaine. I, I can't see everybody. I'm, I'm sort of just a shadow here in the corner. Um, anyway, um, I have to agree with Matthew and Amy. I, I think that to make a wise decision, you need all the facts, not the what ifs. Um, and so if they, if Matthew Kazaka and Mike Emmett can present scenarios to them at 500,000 increments, and this goes at 500, and this goes at a million, and this goes at a, you know, uh, I think that's information that's important to show, not just wait for a number like we have last year. We had a 1.4 all of a sudden, and now we have to cut the 1.4. We, we just got a number. Um, I think they're asking for very thoughtful, um, a, a very thoughtful way to do it, to get the scenarios before they say, wait a minute, you know, let's not go to 1.5 because it's, it's too much. We're going to lose this, this, and this, you know, uh, we have the whole town to consider. We don't have, um, we have all grades K to 12. I mean, there's so much on the plate that, um, I, I really think we do need to get specific because. Otherwise, we're making just a, a you're going to throw it at us and we're just going to have to go back then and do it anyway. So that's my thought. I think Amy and Matt's question is, is a good one. And that's all I thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, can I along those? Please, please. A couple of oh, things. Chris, I, I don't know what I don't know what changed last year, whether it was a unilateral cut and no concern for details to so this year where there is a thoughtful presentation. Now we want thoughtful uh, scenarios. That's the first thing. Second thing, uh, Mayor Rell attended all of our budget discussions, put the time and the energy to go line by line with us as we discussed all these policies and the numbers. They have been available to everybody online. They've been available to the public uh, no stone has been unturned. Everything has been done transparently to present the best budget we can. No one likes to spend more money than they have to. We know what the numbers are, and we can play this game where we say, what's the scenario, and lay out what cuts are means here or there. We know what cuts means. We mean people, less teachers, maybe less aides, maybe less programming, where it happens and who it hurts, uh, we'll always get a reaction because it won't be applied evenly. Our job, elected job, as you know, for many of you on the council who are on the board of ed, is to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of the school system, come up with the budget. We leave it up to you to decide if that budget or that number is something that you can be comfortable with based on the numbers. You tell us what the number is that you feel is appropriate, then we'll go back and make the decisions to make those cuts in the best way we can. And then we will be judged by the voters about our stewardship as you will be judged by the voters dealing with the overall impact on the tax rate where you're weighing not only the school budget, but the town budget and the impact it has on taxpayers of which we are in an unprecedented time of du du duress. Now, I've made no secret that I wish that the, the number was much lower than 3.5, but I've agreed to 3.5 based on the information. But if you decide to take it down, that's your call. And I urge you to make that call and to act as if you don't know what's going on with, this, with the budget. Well, you had the opportunity to participate in that just like we had the opportunity to participate in yours, but we know what our job is. So with all due respect, we have a, uh, we have a, a, a administration under great duress trying to continue with distance learning, trying to deal with all the effects of feeding our children uh, I think we know what the impact is on cuts. Um, and I'm sure we can be reasonable to provide some general scenarios, but you've all been around for a while. You know what that means, that real cuts come with staff. They don't come with pencils and easels 
and a couple of trips uh, abroad, uh, they come with, with, with bodies. And that's the only place it's going to happen. So if we say, well, we'll cut this third grade, fourth grade, grade, sixth grade teacher, then we go back and say, well, why aren't you cutting the eighth grade teacher, the 10th grade teacher? It doesn't matter. That's the Board of Ed's job. That's what we are elected to do. That's what the charter says we should do. And your job is to say, okay, we've looked at it. We don't like it. We want you to spend more or less. And then we will follow that direction. And that's really, I think, where we are. I'm all for communicating here, but let's you know, remember where we were even a year ago when a number was handed to us without anyone asking about scenarios. And we met that challenge by, in a bipartisan way. So that's all I wanted to add on it. Thank you for letting me prattle on. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, before I go to Brooks, I saw Brooks, you had put your hand up. Um, there were, if I remember correctly, over the num last couple of years um, through the budget deliberations, there have been once or twice scenarios presented to us with a 500, a million, a million five. I know I'm asking you off the top of your head, but last year, the cut, the proposed increase cut, so it's not a cut in the definition of a cut, it's a proposed increase cut. What was that amount? One four. One point four proposed really, from the... It was really about 700,000 because if you remember 400,000 was custodial fees that were in both the town and the Board of Ed budget and 265 was the teacher's pension that had been added in because we had thought the governor was going to put that burden on our communities. So 400,000 was a double custodial budget in the town and Board of Ed and 265 was the teacher's pension that was in the Board of Ed and the state budget. So they were both double budgeted. And so six, 650 or 665 of that 1.4 million were not actual cuts. They were, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if you wanna call them cuts, but they were technically double budgeted. It was 1.4 million reduced from the ask. Now, maybe yes. That Maybe the ask had double dipping in it, but it was 1.4 million. I sat on the public side and listened to all the goings ons. I wasn't behind the scenes. I may not have heard what you all talked about, but it, to the public, it came down that if we asked for a $1.5 million reduction, what was it going to take? What was it going to cause? The result. I heard in a public meeting, it was going to take eight teachers. It was going to take the cancellation of uh, freshman sports, the cancellation of spring and fall production, and a couple other things. And that 1.4 still passed as a cut by the last year's town council. But again, the cut was 1.4 million because of the two double two double budgeted items. So you can, you can say it's 1.4, but the actual cuts that the board of had had to make were about 700,000. And so now looking back, did we lose eight teachers last year? Did we lose freshman sports? Did we lose fall and spring production? No, we did not. No, we lost a reading tutor we lost a SDMS RTC position. We lost a Silas Dean Middle School Health and PE teacher. We had the elimination of an instructional supervisor. And then we had one other uh, position that ended up coming back that was a French teacher. So we lost four positions last year. In right. addition to that, we had other reductions, reduction of special education tuition. That's a reduction we've already taken this year. We had a uh, reduction in legal costs of 30,000. I would definitely say not to uh, address legal costs and reduce them anytime now, given the current pandemic. We reduced, as we do every year, instructional supplies by 105,000. We had a variety of different um, reductions that were related to custodial and, ma custodial and maintenance. 
Social Security and Medicare, 70,000. HSA contribution, 33,000. Defined benefit contribution, 131,657. Workers' comp premium, 96,292. And we also reduced WHS stipends. We have the uh, TRB contribution removal uh, that Amy talked about. We had a further reduction to Social Security and Medicare. Uh, so. There's my, my rough and tough. Oh, we reduced uh, replacement and new textbooks to $50,000 as well. Diesel fuel, 12950 we reduced there as well. So we've gone through this process before. That's what we had. That's uh, it's of May 30th of 2019. And, and what you did, Tom, what you did Mike, to, to your credit is that you, you had to get creative. You, you did a fantastic job of... of, of uh, trying to deal with a really bad situation. So, you know, kudos to that. Thank you. But it, you have to admit that it didn't turn out to be exactly like the scenario that was proposed. And that's why I think it's not realistic for a town council person to suggest what the Board of Ed should do with their budget or how they should manage it. We're trying to look at the whole picture of what's the impact to the to all the town residents. And if we have to reduce monies to the Board of Ed, I don't think it's my place to suggest what should be cut or rearranged. That's why we have the professionals in the Board of Ed to make the best of what they have to work with. And it's the same on the town side. We only have X amount to work with, and we have to figure out a way to make that work. And in, in times that we're faced right now, I can't in good conscience tell taxpayers, you gotta come up with more money uh, when you're out of work, or you don't even know when school's gonna go back. It may not even be in the fall. So, I think we have to really uh, take that into consideration as we move forward. Thank you, Tom. You know, those are you know, some of the points that I wanted to make, having sat through those negotiations and asking those same exact uh, questions. Um, not a what if or anything. They were presented to us. Um, I was in the minority at the time, so I had to make those uh, you know, the decision on whether or not to um, cut or increase. Uh, any of those four positions, uh, Mr. Emmett, that you mentioned, had they been refilled at all? They have not. They have and not. then it has, has there been any administrative staff positions that had been cut last year or in years prior? Yeah, the instructional supervisor position, I had two. Uh, I lost one a couple of years ago and I lost the last one last year. I had two instructional supervisors in the curriculum department and those positions have been eliminated. Uh, by a uh, choice of not the council, but the board or by the administration? Well, it ultimately ends up having to be my decision. When I get an allocation, I have to make do with what I have. So that was the allocation. So for example, the instructional supervisor, when I'm faced with having to reduce 1.4 million, I have to look where the big ticket items, and that was a big ticket item. Has it had an impact on the district? It absolutely has. RTC, Responsive Thinking Center at Silas T. Middle School, that was a position that was eliminated as well. That's had a significant impact over at Silas Dean. That's a reality. The gym teacher, we had a, a part-time gym teacher, a third gym teacher actually over at Silas Dean. That position was eliminated and that position was moved over to Weathersfield High School to cover a retirement. And I mentioned earlier in our conversation this evening with regard to enrollment, I had 30 additional seventh graders come in. I didn't have the teacher. So I had class sizes for some of my seventh grades that were 75 kids in, in a gym class with two gym teachers. That's a lot of kids. So yes, there are absolutely impacts with, with these reductions. There's no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. and, and we're gonna be faced with that, you know, if we decide to cut on the, uh, on the town side as well. You know, this is, and I started it off, this is a very difficult period. This is a very difficult time for, for many. Um, 
just the news alone, um, people, and, and I see Mrs. Hughes Granado down below that uh, 4,000 families took advantage of uh, the free food uh, at the high school last week. Do you guys have a sense in how long, does that go until the end of the 180 days? Would that be over in mid-June or is that something that uh, the contractor will continue going until the need is no longer there? Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. We would be requesting guidance from the state on that to see if they'll extend that uh, lunch programming beyond. Uh, you know, for a state, and we started on day one, I made the announcement that we would be closing effective March 16th in the evening on March 12th. We had our lunch program and our breakfast program up and running on Monday, March 16th. Um, as a state, um, we have distributed over 4 million, 4 million meals across the state. Um, our program also encompasses weekend meals. So not only when you come in on Friday, not only do you get lunch and breakfast for that day or for the following day, you get it for the whole weekend. Um, so that's critically important. Whether or not the state's gonna to continue to support that, I'm not sure. Again, that's another one of those pieces that we're waiting on for, uh, with regard to guidance. Gotcha, I mean, we're waiting on guidance practically every single day. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. And so that, the funding for that, uh, Chartwells, it's, that's being paid for by the state right now? That's correct. We've uh, requested a series of waivers um, to allow um, our lunch process to begin. The state has given us uh, broad leeway. Uh, so for example, you don't have to be a Weathersfield public school student. You can be a resident of Weathersfield. Um, and then they've broadened that even to if you're not a resident of Weathersfield, if you need it, come and get it. Um, yeah. Originally, it was pretty restrictive where you had to have the student in, in the car with you. Um, as we embarked upon distance learning, that became a little more difficult. So mom might be coming to get the, the lunch and the child was home doing distance learning, you know, under the direction of dad and the teacher. So we got a waiver for that. Um, you know, we got a waiver to go from inside the cafeteria to outside. Obviously with social distancing and the restrictions that got tighter, we had to move from inside the cafeteria to a drive up, grab and go, which, which we've done. Um, I, I'm very proud of the program. I think it's been excellent. We actually opened up a uh, satellite Monday, Wednesday, Friday over on Lancaster to support families in that neighborhood as well. And we've actually had some volunteers that have helped um, up in the north end of town getting um, meals out to families that can't get to Weathersfield High School. So. Thank you, Mike. Um, and, and I have to give kudos to them as well. Because, and you are right. You know, that that following Monday, you were, you were right out there with the, um, the cafeteria staff. I, I myself uh, took it upon you know, myself to go around to a number of uh, areas around town that provide services. And that was one of my first stops was to, uh, to thank them. Um, at that point in early to mid-March, we thought it would just simply be a, um, a temporary uh, feed the kids, as you had said, you know, and, and maybe get a waiver for um, uh, families to with remote learning to just have mom uh, pick it up. But it has now turned into where families with no kids in the school system, families with no kids in Weathersfield, as well as, you know, the general public just simply going there for for meals. Um, the lieutenant governor said it, unfortunately, the cars went on for miles and miles at Rensselaer Field the, last week for a food distribution event. Um, this is something that, you know, I heard my grandparents talk about how they hoarded food and, and you know, conserved as much as they could, put money as, aside under the mattress and, 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 you know, ate chicken right to the bone because they didn't know when the next meal would be coming. This is something we haven't seen since late to mid 1930s. And, um, you know, it's uncharted territory for us right now. We are doing the best that we can uh, and, you know, working on budgets both for the board side and for the town side to try and, and, and get a, a medium. Um, I definitely have never been one to be polarizing and pitting one side versus the other. I, I 
have always bought, uh, believed in and will continue to believe in consensus building. I am, that is my ultimate goal on this. Um, there are, you know, I do have, you know, some questions about the budget and, you know, I, I would like to go over this a little bit deeper, you know, having looked at it from probably early February on. I mean, I, I do think there are some places for savings in here. I mentioned just a couple of them. The, you know, some of them are unknowns, as Tom had said, with, you know, whether or not school would be back in in, in, um, in the fall. Um, but I, I, I would like to know where there could be some additional savings beyond the, you know, contractual savings uh, that are in there. The, um, the salaries take up 94% of this increase. I mean, it, that is, is staggering. It's um, not staggering so much that it's the amount of salaries, but it is that, you know, you guys really have over the last six years been asked to cut and reduce your, your asks. Um, you know, I'm not going to, belabor the point of $1.4,700,000, but it, it was a decrease in your increase. Um, specifically looking at staff numbers right now on the board side, are you above or below where you were at this point last year with staff levels? We are above in teachers we are below in administration, we're below in tutors, and I believe we're below in secretaries and paras. Total number, are we even out or are we plus? As a whole, as a whole district, I would say that we're plus in terms of teachers. Um, FTE numbers? FTE numbers, I'll have to get you those, but I can certainly do that. So, and again, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation tonight with regard to teacher increase, like the ELL teachers, the teacher increase, it's not an increase to our operating budget. It's a reallocation of the existing budget. In some cases, it may be grant funded. Um, as Matt mentioned earlier, we have a special ed teacher who was covered out of the IDEA grant. Um, and with our tutor budget, we reduced the number of tutors, reduced the number of hours so that we could get the necessary funds to hire a certified ELL teacher to support our burgeoning ELL population, which at last count was north of 300 students. And I'm at the point now where I've got, I have to offer bilingual programming at several of our elementary schools because of numbers. Okay, and can that come from existing staff? or would that be new hire for, for language? That would be for an ELL, that would need to be a new hire. Uh, that's another one of those specialty areas, as I mentioned to Tom earlier in the conversation about that savings of, of where they're at. Teachers have specific certifications and the state requires that a, a specific teacher has the appropriate certification to teach in that area. So English language learner, an ELL certificate, a TESOL certificate is a specialized certificate that most of our classroom uh, staff do not have. So I don't have a, a cadre of ELL teachers that are in classrooms that if I cut a classroom position, I could ship them over. Um, is there, this may be going off tangent just a little bit, but is there any talk amongst either CABE or caps or, or uh, boards of ed or superintendents for any waivers of requirements. You had just mentioned certain teaching requirements for uh, specialty. Is there any talk about waiving any of those requirements during this pandemic that, you know, maybe if we're looking at hiring or if we are going to be losing a teacher through retirement that, that we may be able to hire somebody qualified but without the state required uh, certificates? Yeah, the state actually has a, a process in place. It's called a DSAP. Um, it's a durational shortage area position. 
So we have, you know, for example, like ELL, special education has now come into that realm where the numbers are dwindling. And with a DSEP in certain cases, the state will allow you a waiver to have someone, let's say, for example, world language. If I have somebody who is certified in French and I can't find a French teacher, I may be able to hire a teacher that is certified in a different area to teach that. That's a short-term solution. It's something mm -hmm. that, that does not last in infinity. And there is some level of movement in terms of which positions qualify um, for a DSAP. Okay. Thank you. Um, did anybody else have any questions? Any, um, you know, I'll open it up. Oh, sorry, Kevin. Thanks, Mike. I, I just have one quick question regarding um, the governor's executive order uh, regarding any potential layoffs on the board of ed side. I know they said that municipalities could not do that um, for a, a certain amount of time. Does that just go through this um, school year? It does not, I assume, extend beyond uh, July? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know what the uh, time frame for that is. I don't know if there's a time frame attached to it, but that's a, a very viable question. And, you know, with regard to that executive order, Kevin, where, you know, you must rehire folks where practicable. Um, you know, we've done everything we can to bring, you know, I had people that I could not maintain. I didn't have anything for them to do. So again, as I've had to rehire them, we have been extraordinarily creative. So I've got lunch aides helping out at that Lancaster satellite spot for lunch. Um, when our Chromebooks arrive, I'm going to have a cadre of folks that will come in using social distancing um, to help the tech team get those machines up and running. So we're trying to keep people as engaged as we possibly can. Um, in terms of how long this is going to last, I, I don't know. It's a good question. Just like, just in terms of guidance, I mean, the sooner we can get that, because if, if that ties our hands in terms of any types of budgeting, I mean. It's my understanding we can lay people off because of budgeting for next year, Kevin, if that's what you're asking. We couldn't lay them off during the pandemic, but if your allocation requires us to lay people off for the budget, it's my understanding we are able to lay people off. But uh, my, my question is, when, when does that, like, how long, does that go through this school year or does it go to a specific date? That, well, what I'm saying is the allocation, I, my understanding is that as of June 30th, so if your allocation to us requires us to lay people off to maintain, to, to uh, equalize the budget, that can happen. That's my understanding of the executive order in my meetings that I've been in. Okay. Right, thank you. Did I answer that, Kevin? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Matt Kazaka, do we, or do you have the, the numbers for summer school, uh, financials? I mean, how much does it cost the town or board of ed to host or hold, uh, summer school, uh, for the students? Do we know roughly how much? Last year yeah, in town last year we spent about seventy five thousand, excluding transportation. That's excluding. All, that's excluding. Yep. That's teachers, paras, nurse, uh, supervisor for the program. And when does when this year when does summer school start? I don't know the dates. I tip. Some years we will have a week prior to July and then have a short week with the 4th of July. And then there's some years where everything begins in July and it's just that, that whole month. But I don't know the dates scheduled for this year. Yeah, it, it, it depends on the conclusion of the school year. So usually it's the following. Now we, right now we're slated to end on the 15th of, of June. So it would either be later in the week, perhaps the 17th, or they may wait until the following week um, mm -hmm. to, to do it there. And again, let me be clear with regard to this extended school year, there are significant legal ramifications if I'm not providing it. So I have to provide it in some way, shape or form um, as it's part of a student's IEP. Right. Uh, many of these students in the, the duration during the day for 
summer school is that uh, I was hearing eight until 11 or so during the day. Is that uh, the time frame? Yes, it is. And then they typically move over to a uh, parks and rec program for a youth camp program where they continue their learning through, you know, the required IEP. Some, some do. And then I also have some that are in outplacements. Um, so they would attend their summer school and out of district placements, depending upon their IEP. I have uh, some of our students that participate in Camp Sunrise over in Glastonbury. So they're transported out to Camp Sunrise uh, where they get their programming there. Um, and again, it, it depends upon the specific case. For some, they will uh, engage in the therapeutic rec program. Um, mm -hmm. In some cases, they head home. Some cases, they may go to private therapy. Um, in the afternoon, so we depend that on a case by case basis. Okay, thanks, Mike. And, and that therapeutic rec coordinator position is a town position, not a board position. Correct. Yep. Uh, I hadn't looked through, not knowing, you know, when we first looked at the budget, what is, did you guys allocate 75,000 again for summer school this year? Yes, approximately. Okay, and in in addition to that would be the fuel cost or transportation cost, which, which is about forty thousand. Forty thousand. But that could that comes increase, out. right? That could Excuse increase. Me? That could increase if they, depending on social distancing and how we have to do busing. Correct, Matt? Yeah, we. I don't know anything about busing for next year. Or even for the summer is what I'm saying. We exactly. Don't know. Yep. Next fiscal year. In in Chuck, how would how would social distancing affect or increase that forty thousand? Well, you might not be able to put as many kids on a bus as you normally would because they got to be farther apart from each other. So you might right. need more buses. You may also need to incorporate a monitor on the bus if there isn't one on the bus to ensure that kids are socially distancing. I will say that typically speaking in the summertime, we don't utilize the big buses. We utilize the smaller buses um, and there may be monitors on there. Uh, but again, it's going to depend upon what the guidelines are in terms of how many kids on a bus. Mm -hmm. And how many are in a classroom at any given time? How many are in, uh, I think it's... OEC rules are 30 or fewer and no more than 10 in a room. Um, that's going to have to be considered, but you know, are we going or would we be sending kids to, do you feel that more kids would be going or less or the same to out of town placement like Camp Sunrise? No, that's, that's uh, typically we have a cadre of kids that go to Camp Sunrise every year. Um, so I'm not anticipating that that number is going to go up. Um, and again, the Camp Sunrise program that focuses on our students that are um, working on adaptive daily living skills. Um, and typically with our special ed summer school over at Webb, our class sizes are small because the instruction is very pinpointed and very specific to the individual child. So I'm not anticipating an issue with class sizes for summer school. Obviously the numbers that you're talking about with the, you know, the, the 30 and no more than 10 in a room, that's gonna be a, a major challenge for our friends at the YMCA who are intending to run the summer program over at Hanmer this summer. Definitely gonna be a challenge for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brooks, you had a question. Just really a comment. I think someone spoke to the magnitude of the increase and in the vast majority of it was in salary and, and wages and, and health care. And I know health care spending in, in the country is just a very difficult item. It, it, it's disheartening both for the Board of Ed and for the town to think that we may be laying people off when we haven't even had the opportunity to see if there is a willingness to try to forego compensation in light of these, you know, unprecedented economic times. So I don't know how appropriate it is the conversation, um, but I do think it's something we, we should at least look at. It's hard to go to someone who's lost their job or taking a 30% pay cut 
to then ask, make a big ask for more money when you know a lot of that money is, is going to a raise for someone. And I understand it's a contractual obligation, but it's just in light of what we're facing, I think it's a, it's a difficult ask. Thank you. Um, one thing, you know, healthcare cost in Gary, you may need to chime in or, or Mike O'Neill, uh, the prescription savings plan that had been discussed on the town side and savings that we were possibly anticipating on the board side. It was a, a, a new prescription program by our um, healthcare uh, well, consultant or provider. Can you shed some light on that, Gary or Mike, right now on that? Yeah, um, what we're trying to, you want like an explanation of the RX program? The, the and well, yes, the one that would have an possible anticipated savings. Yep, so the idea is it's a prescription, and Mike, you can jump in too, but it's a prescription carve out. So specifically uh, over the last year, um, there was some staff time appropriated to going out and RFPing and trying to find cost savings within the health uh, provision. Um, what we realized is there might be some savings within the prescription component specifically of it. Um, and I think there's a total anticipated savings. We included $100,000 on our end. I can't remember what the exact total was. Um, 250,000, Gary. 250. If, uh, if Townwide and Board of Ed participated, I know there was a series of um, workshops that took place trying to speak with different um, unions across um, across all sides, Library Town, Board of Ed. I don't know the existing status um, of it in terms of where we are. I know our consultant was trying very difficult, uh, diligently to uh, to get that done so that we could we could sign a deal and realize the savings. Um, and and. We need kind of all parties to come to the table for an agreement. Uh, the employees have to agree. Um, I don't know if Stephanie's on the line as well. Might have more or Mike, did I kind of capture everything? Yeah, it's just, it's taking the management of the prescription component of the medical program away from Anthem. Anthem is not transparent about the rebates that they receive from the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, the company that we're, we're, that we had the proposal from is very transparent about that. And in fact, they guarantee a certain level of savings to the town and the board um, related to the rebates. Um, so if we, if we made this change, it would, you know, the estimate we have from our consultant, if all unions went along with this proposal would be a savings of roughly 250,000. And it was split very, very quickly um, 100 to the town and 150 to the board just so that we could include uh, on the town side before we publish the proposed budget that the hundred thousand dollars of savings okay do we have that hundred thousand in savings it's not realized in our budget though it's in the proposed budget it is in our proposed budget so we have it yep. and and we've reached out to the board or board of ed or administration on it have you guys mike or matt considered that one hundred and fifty thousand at all or have you brought it before your um uh, union bargaining units we we have uh we did that very recently uh and met with all of our bargaining units at this point in time uh we believe we have agreement from all with the exception of the weathersfield federation of teachers uh, their, con their contract does allow for a 90 day notice, uh, which did not happen. And uh, we're working with them now to hopefully make this, uh, this actually happen. So we're meeting our contractual obligation at this point in time and, and conversing with them. But I do hope that uh, they get on board with this. Is, and would that be a realized $150,000 savings? No, it would not. Uh, unfortunately, Mike O'Neill provided some information the other day that 
the actuary updated the mortality tables for the defined benefit contribution. Mm -hmm. And we had budgeted a 5% increase based on historical trends. <coughs> and with the revision, the board's increase is actually 37%. So the total aggregate for the town and the board is 18%. The split on the board side is up 163,000 from the current budget. So that 150 would essentially wash. Hmm. This is the, you know, what we went over on our budget side the other day, Mike, on your uh, finance department, the, that is the mortuary table for pensioning or those receiving pension who live longer. And I mean, there's nothing we can do with that. That is set. You know, can we, can we adjust those numbers? Are there, uh, is there a request to be able to, to put into them to say, you know, can we partial fund, partially fund that increase this year, considering, you know, the situation we are in, can we put that off? We've got, we asked for scenarios from the actuaries. They gave us two, um, which involve, uh, there's two assumptions that uh, that are changing. One is the the mortality tables, um, the new tables that go into effect. The other is the interest rate that we assume we will earn on the assets in the trust. Um, we have a we have a target that we've been working towards bringing that down. When you bring the assumed rate of return down, uh, that means there's less from earnings on assets going into the fund, therefore there has to be more in terms of contributions from the town and the board. So they've given us two scenarios. Um, we've implemented the scenario that creates a level increase in contributions going into 21 and then into 22. And, and you have to bear in mind also that last, you know, we've lost quite a bit of value um, on the assets in the fund. So that's gonna be a third factor that plays into the contribution, not for the budget we're talking about, but for the fiscal 22 budget. So the bottom line is it's, there's scenario A is roughly a 15% increase for fiscal 21, and then about the same amount, 15 or 16% for 22. The other option reduces the increase for 21 slightly and kind of pushes that off in, and creates a, I think it's a 21% increase for fiscal 22. So it's just, it's, it's a little bit of savings uh, for this budget that, that we're working on and it, it creates a, a pretty substantial increase um, in the next one. And all indications are from the state that um, projected deficit this year of nearly $1 billion would be covered through rainy day fund, but they only have a $2.5 billion rainy day fund. So their out years have uh, approximately three, 3.25 billion decrease um, forecasted over the next, not this fiscal year coming up, but you know, actually this fiscal year, not 20, but FY 21, 22, and 23, we're over a $3 billion deficit. So I don't see next year being any prettier for money coming from the state to, to Wethersfield. So, you know, obviously we can have the discussions on what we want to do uh, with that. But if we're going to decrease our increase this year to put, put off until next year, probably not wise considering what's coming down the pike for um, deficits over the next two years, three years. Um, just me, you know, talking. Yes, Amy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Has there been any talk about the, um, the, the uh, Board of Ed or the teachers moving to the state health insurance plan? And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know much about it, but I think I read somewhere, um, did West Hartford go that route and saved, um, some substantial money by doing that. And again, I don't, I don't know details about it, but I, I thought I read something that it, there was a, 
savings with doing that. Yes, West Hartford did go to the state plan. Uh, my understanding with the most recent uh, teachers union contract, it was looked at and it was not determined to be uh, significant savings. Uh, we've also looked at that plan with secretaries and paras as well, and it was the same scenario. Um, at this point in time, all of our folks are on the HSA. Uh, as we went through contract negotiations over the past four or five years, each of our bargaining units has moved from the PPO over to the HSA. Um, so we're utilizing that. In fact, when we moved the teachers over, we gave them a one year kind of a moratorium, if you will, where they could continue to uh, keep the PPO and pay the difference. And everybody uh, in the entire unit went over to the HSA. So I know that was recently looked at in the most recent uh, contract negotiations and it was not determined to be uh, cost effective to make that change. Thanks for looking into it though. You're welcome. Every contract negotiation we look, any way we can save on the health insurance, we're looking at it. I think, and I know Stephanie does um, for our side as well. Thank you. Anybody with any questions, additional questions for either Matt or Mike or Chuck? Matt. I just got to go over here and finish the mute, uh, hit the mute button. Um, so last, when we, as we were talking through a little recent scenario, Chris Healy brought up the high level of staff that are involved in this particular increase. I think Brooks might've talked about it a little bit too. So if we, if the council does choose to reduce, is it the priority of the board of education that they will be reducing staff? I don't know if that's directed at anyone in particular, but I would imagine that depending on the size of it, it's very hard to get to those sort of numbers without, as we did last year, having to uh, make changes in staffing. And as you know, it can take many forms. So for example, last year, we thought we'd have to lay off <clears throat> more staffers, but several staffers retired, as I, if Mike can correct me, and we, were on a, we did not fill them or you can rehire, you know, you, you can, in other words, if you're, someone from, is retiring at a very high level, uh, you can always maybe uh, re, uh, replace that position with someone with uh, less years and, and at a lower salary and, and extrapolate some savings that way. Uh, and as you know, it's, it's a fluid it, it situation depending on um, where you are. And, you know, just to come back to another point, I mean, I. We are in a, we all talk about this on trying times, and it's true because we don't really have a grip on uh, where this economy is going to be in terms of funds that come to the town of Weathersfield, people paying taxes, uh, what those receipts will look like, what the kind of aid we may get from both the state and federal government, whether the federal government continues to pour money into the state, and the state has the uh, the flexibility as the governor's indicated to help certain uh, school districts but my guess is they're going to help school districts that have more acute needs based on poverty and other indicators um, and we have the other issue that we talked about before which is you know um, both the town and the school side are in a position that no one foresaw but that's true for every other town and district in the state so you know again it's going to come down to personnel. Uh, it always does, but whether it's three teachers here, five paraprofessionals there, that, that'll be left up to us to decide and try to do it with as little disruption as possible. But, um, you know, that's just the way I think this, that's the way the charter lays it out for our responsibilities. So, I, you know, Matt, so, I, can't, so I, I, can't, I can't tell you if it's going to be, I mean, and I don't think Mike could tell you, it's, is it going to be a ninth grade teacher? Is it going to be a, a whatever? It, it's going to have some impact somewhere. And we won't know the impact of it until it happens. And we try to make adjustments to make up for it with the staff we have. So at this point, you're, what is, if the first cuts, if the, this council decides to cut money and that money is going to be directed initially in the reduction of staff, what would be the priority of the Board of Education as to the type of staff would it reduce? Would it be the paralegals, would it be the classroom teachers? 
as we know the situation right now? Matt, we would look for Mr. Remy and Mr. Kazaka to give us the best budget with the least amount of disruption to the education of our students and, and have discussion around that. So we can't, I can't, we can't tell you right now what it would be. They haven't had a chance to look at it. You haven't given us a number. When you give us a number, they'll go back, they'll meet with their central office staff that we pay to make these decisions and they will come to the board with what they think is the best decision for us to make to have the least amount of disruption of education in Weathersfield. So then maybe I should direct it to Mr. Emmett. Mr. Emmett, if we were to reduce the budget, how would you prioritize the losses? It sounds like it's sort of like bare bones. We're getting right to the core of people. How would you prioritize the losses if this council were to, to decide to make reductions? It's going to end. It's it's going to end up being classroom teachers, unfortunately. So with, with um, the salary you, rate where they are, and you know the number of paraprofessionals I have. Again, with paraprofessionals, they're paid at a much lower rate. So how will I reduce class? Uh, how will I reduce staff? Well, I might look at it through attrition, like I did this current year. When I have a retirement, I replace a position from within and I don't fill it. So if I have a kindergarten teacher retiring, then I don't fill that position. And I run the risk, of course, of COVID-19 uh, restrictions that may restrict class size. And then I have to deal with that situation where I've reduced a, uh, a teacher to increase class size and I may be restricted in terms of class sizes for next year. So it's, it's looking at classroom teachers. Um, over the course of the years, uh, the, the school that I think has taken it the hardest in terms of reductions has been Weathersfield High School. In terms of specific programs where we've had teachers retire and we haven't filled positions, or we've moved people out of the high school and moved them elsewhere in the district where they're certified. So I'm at that point now where it's going to end up being um, it's classroom staff. I have no administration left to move at this point in time to reduce. I no longer have a director of operations and maintenance. I do not have an instructional supervisor for math. I do not have an instructional supervisor for literacy. I have a uh, athletic director that serves two roles. That's both assistant principal and athletic director. So two for one. And that goes back almost eight years. So I'm into classroom staff at this point in time. And as far as the priority of classroom staff at the different levels we have, elementary, middle school and high school, what will be the priority to be able to reduce? It sounds like high school has been reduced, would not be the priority from your recent comments. So would we be looking at other levels when we start to pull classroom teachers? What would the priority level be? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to explain that at this point in time in terms of what the priority level is. Let me give you another reality that we faced. The board this year had to enact graduation requirements at the high school. It's a state law. Uh, we had enacted them. We had budget issues over the past couple of years. We rescinded them and the state said, it's law. We're not kicking it down the uh, road anymore. It's law. So you have to have a certain number of credits. It's 25 credits as a minimum. Well, as it is, the board has approved that. I struggle now with the number of sections that I have at the high school to be able to provide kids with the number of courses that they need especially those kids that are on the cusp. I've got my high flyers that even with the 22 and a half credits, they're gonna pull 30 credits. But I also have kids on the cusp that are gonna to struggle to get to that 22.5 mark. They're gonna struggle harder to get to that 25 credit mark. So there's limitations there. So where do you get to? You get to elementary classes. I mean, already at Silas Dean Middle School, I've got some rather robust class sizes. Take a look at the uh, world language. I've got world language classes of upwards of 30 kids. So I don't have a lot of, of leeway. So you get into classroom teachers at the elementary level. That's the unfortunate truth. So that's where you think it would start. And then that I'm asking what that seems like it would lead to higher class sizes at the elementary level. And then if the, depending on the size of the cuts, you would be working probably sounds like on your way from elementary to middle school to high school. Is that generally accurate? Generally? That's, that's generally accurate. And then what would be the, val the cost if, if, in order to remove an FTE, what is the sort of savings? Is it, all, and I, I don't wanna make up a number, $100,000 with salary and benefits on, on average, 
if we were to say, hey, let's let's reduce half a million dollars, you average amounts about 100,000, it's five positions. So we're looking at five teachers. Is, is that the scenario? I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, what's going to end up happening uh, is, and we do this every year, and it's one of the things that I hate to do, but we non-renew our non-tenured staff. So you're technically, traditionally, not reducing positions that have the highest salary. You're reducing the entry level positions where they're not tenured. So the board took the action uh, of non renewing, I believe it was 51 or 52 teachers um, that have been noticed that at this point in time, until the budget is worked out, that their contract ends as of June 30th. And then you have to look at the numbers. So if you, you know, cut the board budget a million dollars, I have to look at how many teachers, most of them at that lower level, like master step one, um, I have to look at the number that's gonna get me to a million. Typically speaking, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt Kazaka, for every four teachers we lay off, we lay off a fifth to cover the unemployment. Is that's that correct? A, we've used that in the past, yes. Okay, so we have that to consider as well. And do we have, uh, Matt Kazaka, is there basically sort of like an average or at least some rule of thumb that we could sort of, that could guide our decision making as far as the laying off of staff and the resulting savings? Well, as Mr. Emmett stated, you're going to go with the new hires and the lower step in level. So if you say even mid 50s plus single benefits, you're going to have a young teacher. So perhaps 60,000. Our average salary in Weathersfield is probably mid 80s, so that's not an accurate representation. Okay, so if we take and that's include if at the sixty thousand, if six hundred thousand dollars were reduced, we're looking at about ten staff members. Is that generally accurate, or did I not do that correctly? It is, and then as we said, we add in you know another teacher or two to cover unemployment, so perhaps a dozen a dozen teachers at that level. Now, not to do sky is falling scenario, but are there other scenarios that we could, areas we can reduce before we hit, uh, you know, elementary school teachers? Or is that, and, I, and I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not trying to do sky is falling opposition party politics, like just trying to figure out what it is. I don't think that's something the board wants to discuss at this time. They don't want to discuss other scenarios be besides reducing the staff in order to get to the number. We don't have a scenario presented and I don't think I'm going to speak on behalf of the board or the superintendent. I think that's something we would need to meet and discuss. It did sound like the first priority of the cuts, and maybe this goes back to Mr. Emmett, was the classroom staff and that was sort of the discussion with Mr. Healy and so forth. So that and I'm asking, is there other stuff before we get to that that's possible? And it doesn't sound like it is, but I'm just trying to understand the field here. Another another fifty thousand dollars in instructional supplies, maybe. Uh, okay. Legal legal services, complete roll of the dice, twenty thirty thousand. I mean, I, I don't know what else. Uh, IT department reductions, I've already taken 67,000. Perhaps I can get another 33 more and roll the dice. So that, that's, that's where we're at. And, you know, some of these reductions we've taken up front. And, you know, again, outplacement uh, tuition, that is a powder keg. You never know what you're going to get. You want me to roll, roll the dice and cut $100,000? Uh, yeah, that's exactly why I was running a deficit back in November this year, because of special ed costs. So right. it's tough. And I mean, you know, Matt, I will tell you, we have gone through every line of this budget. I'm, I'm not coming in with a budget that's six or seven or 8%. I'm coming in where I'm covering the contractual obligations to maintain the programs for our kids. So it's, it's getting tight. I'm running Thank out of time. Thank you for explaining. Thank you for explaining what would happen with the reduction. That, that was very helpful in understanding what will happen. My pleasure. I have a quick sort of follow-up to that. It seems like over the years, I don't know if it's safe to say that as reductions have been made to the budget, so um, the percentage of the budget that consists of wages and benefits has increased while the percentage of the budget that's for programs and such has shrunk. Is that correct? That is, that is accurate. 
and, and especially then, with the last two years of health costs. Okay, so uh, because uh, you know it's it's it is difficult, and I know a few others have raised this, but with the economic devastation that you know we're experiencing, like Great Depression level unemployment, and we're you know the budget is increasing, and we're being asked to fund this budget fully so that everyone who works for the Board of Ed can get a raise. And I understand that it is union contracts. And in Connecticut, unlike the majority of states um, where public sector employees aren't allowed to even negotiate wages and benefits because they quickly get out of control. And even the federal government is not permitted. They can unionize, but um, wages and benefits are off limits because it could really, um, because of the effect that it can have when, well, I don't, I don't want to go into the whole uh, background of that, but I just think it's difficult to look at the residents of Wethersfield and say, we're sorry, but we get to raise your taxes so all these people could get a raise. And they're uh, wonderful. Like, I know I've heard nothing but great things about all the employees, not just the teachers, but the staff, the lunchroom, you know, the paras, they're great. But a lot of really great employees in other sectors have been laid off. A lot of really great employees in other sectors have gotten, uh, have had to take pay cuts. So I just think it's, it's tough and I just wanna raise, I don't know if you could go to these employees and, and even on the town side and say, you know what? The people of Weathersfield are really hurting. This isn't a normal year. Like, would you consider giving up your raise this year to help out the people of this town who have lost their jobs. We're talking about the long line of cars to to get the food at the food bank or to pick up the, the breakfast and lunch at the high school. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really sad. It's like, I'm like, and it's just, so it's kind of hard to swallow that. Oh, but they really need their raise because it's in the contract. So I just don't know if you've considered, you know, asking them to forego it just one year, delay it one year. It's just something I just want to raise and something we should think about. Thanks. Thank you. At, at this point in time, I have not been directed by board leadership uh, to move in that direction. Um, and, you know, to your point, I agree. Um, and listening to what Mayor Rell said earlier, this is not going to be a one year thing. So, you know, my one caution with the idea of going to bargaining units and requesting a freeze for this upcoming year is what do we do the year beyond? We're, we're in this, and Mike, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We're in this for the long haul here. You're looking at two or three years. We might be able to get through, you know, fiscal 21 with the rainy day fund, but it's not going to last unless we get significant revenue increases, which right now, nobody can predict that. And if I had to be a betting man, I would say, no, it's not coming. So. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. It's not a pretty situation. It's not pretty at all. Um, town or board side. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what we are doing. I, I would imagine that, uh, um, you know, Kevin, Amy, all of us will be, you know, sharpening our pencils as well. Um, looking at uh, the town manager's budget. Um, it, we're gonna have to have a thorough um, look at it. Um, speaking of raises, I mean, I know contractually there are raises in uh, for the teacher's side. Uh, do we know what they are? Are they two? Well, I guess, let me go back. Which, how many of the bargaining units are at a, um, the, are you a three year or a two year contract for your bargaining units? Three year contract. Three year. Yep. How many of them are at their three year? I will be uh, getting ready to negotiate this summer with the administrative union. 
Uh, we will re-engage with, I believe, Paris and secretaries. And are nurses up, Matt? Yep. Nurses are up as well. Yes. So you've got a bargaining unit. I know with nurses, it's, I believe, eight. Uh, administrators, it's 13. And secretaries in Paris, 120 maybe. That's a larger union. And you know, just so everyone knows within the scope of the public with regard to the administrative group, the administrative group in the current contract, the first year of their contract took a hard zero. The last time we had budget issues. So the, the administrative group has definitely uh, stepped up to the plate over this current contract. And it's, they're in the third year of a three year, so hard zero, year one, year yes, two? Uh, year two, I want to say was around two, and I think this year was two. I'd have to get the numbers. Um, and th let's look at the larger secretaries in Paris at 120. Third year of a three-year contract. Where are we with those guys per uh, percentage-wise over the years? I mean, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Maybe this is something I can ask and we can receive um, before deliberations. Maybe if I can go one step further, not only for those that are up in the third year of their bargaining, of the, the bargaining units third year, why don't we look if we can get contracts for all bargaining units and where they are. And right, right the, up on our website. It's up on the website. Yep. They're all on the website. Okay. We'll take a look at that. So you get like with the teacher's contract and get all the stipends. You can get the salary schedules, administrators, nurses, secretaries, and paras. Yeah, I understand that. But I guess what the contracted increases had been over the, la uh, the term of the contract actually spelled out. Not like, I mean, I can look at so-and-so who makes this this year and what they made last year and the year before. Mm -hmm. But is that on site? The yeah, you, you'll see, on. yeah, you'll see a grid in each contract that has the, the various steps, yep. the level of um, schooling. So for the teachers, for example, it'll be bachelors, masters, masters plus 30, masters plus 60. And then it'll give you the salary schedule for three years. So. But Mike, it won't have the breakdown. I know you're asking for the percentage of increase per year under salary. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not in the contract. You'd have to mathematically do that or Matt would have to give it to you. I, Trent may Stop. have something available, especially for the secretaries in Paris. Okay. Okay. Mike, are you were you asking for the teachers? You're right. I mean, any bargaining unit. So, I mean, just to get a sense of what what we had real seen over the the last couple of years and what we may be faced with coming up going forward. Um, you know, forecasting where we may be trending. Um, so it's on the town side as well. It's not just a uh, admin. It's not just a, a, a board of ed. It's not just a uh, um, union uh, secretary, nurse, or parent. It's, it's across the board. Uh, do you have a breakdown of the, um, I guess, you know, or the, the steps, you know, how many are in your highest step for teachers? Do we know that? We do. Give a percentage of your teachers, I guess. Yep. Give me a few seconds. Let me see if I can find the sheet. Mike, I believe Chuck told us it was 60% or 65% of teachers were at their top step, either the masters or masters plus categories. Yeah, if you're looking at, so master's plus, we have 30, let's call it 37%, but if you add in 
uh, just a master's top staff two, between the two, you're looking at 67%, so two thirds. Two thirds are at the top step, and I believe the, the wage adjustment is roughly 1%, maybe a little bit higher. Um, those that are stepping up and are moving across, I calculated the average, it was roughly across all, and there are some bumps. I know it's all negotiated, but across all is roughly 5.5%. Okay. Uh, does it correlate between, you know, those with master's plus and, and beyond that, that 67%, obviously they are tenured, uh, teachers and most likely are they closer to retirement age or they it could be that they are, you know, younger and, and newer teachers and have fulfilled their, um, Education requirements. I believe we're only like three or four people above 30 years in the district, right? Because I've asked that question, Michael or Matt. Yeah, we we tend not to see teachers leave. They come and they stick around. Right now, my teacher with the most amount of tenure, I want to say, is in year 40, 46. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but the vast majority of people have been, you know, you're talking 30 years. Or thereabouts, and again, I have to go back and get a, a breakdown for you in terms of the exact numbers on that. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I want to just take a quick look to see if any of the other Board of Ed folks are on. I see Bobby's phone. I don't see her photo or um, video though. I don't know if she's on. Uh, anybody from the board just wanted to say anything? Kenny, I mean, I'm going to open up the floor to you guys, Jim. Um, I know you've been all working hard uh, at this and, uh, you know, obviously I want to give you an opportunity to say a few remarks. I appreciate that, Mike. Um, and I appreciate all the effort that's going into this from all the uh, staff and all the elected officials. And, um, you know, obviously I support the board's budget, but I, I really understand where you're all coming from and, and understand the position we're all in. I uh, just wouldn't uh, hope that we don't hurt the school system in our deliberations, but I do appreciate all the efforts being made by everyone. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kenny. Jim. Uh, yes, uh, thank, thank you everyone for all of your hard work. And I did want to mention um, about uh, Camp Sunrise, uh, that that generally uh, takes place uh, at schools in uh, Glastonbury. So I'm not sure uh, how well that will, will fare. Uh, the last I've heard is that that's supposed to start up at the end of June, but that's uh, preliminary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think Chuck, uh, going forward, we'll probably have a couple questions directed to you as, or anybody else um, on leadership of uh, the Board of Ed. And then, I mean, if you can relay those questions over to uh, uh, Mr. Emmett and, uh, and to Matt, we would appreciate it. Obviously, okay. we, we've got a couple more questions we would like to ask. Hold on one moment, please. Did you mute everybody? I did not. Oh. <clears throat> Hold on one moment. New norm. I wonder how long we're going to have to be doing this. A little technical difficulty. Um, Zoom. What do you guys think? Okay. I think we got them all. You should be good now. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely on. So I thank you. Um, I think this is our third and final workshop. 
We will begin uh, deliberations uh, next week. Um, I believe the first one is on the 19th, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, no, we actually have a council meeting on the 18th. Council Monday. meeting on the 18th. Seven o'clock. Uh, details will be provided, but I think most likely the same call-in number, um, maybe a different passcode or something. That is so, correct. Uh, and Gary, you will have that uh, agenda for us shortly, correct? Yep, yep. thank you. Um, well, with that, I will uh, adjourn. Wait. Oh, Kevin, sorry. I'm sorry, do you, do you have a, an idea for next week just so we can block out our calendars for deliberation? Yeah, they, I, I, I was going to ask Gary to send an invite like he did for all these sessions. If, yeah, you'll, if, you'll get another one. They, they have been kind of, um, it's the 19th at 6. Tuesday the 19th at 6 and then Thursday the 21st at 6. And you'll send an invite? Yep. Thank you. Yep, that'll go out. That'll be posted in, um, posted on the web, posted in the paper as well, uh, so that it meets all the requirements associated. It wasn't on, I actually looked yesterday. It was not, it's not on the web, I don't believe. Yeah, yeah, it, it hasn't, it hasn't been posted yet. Okay. Matt Forrest. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike. Mike, I was wondering what your thoughts were on, I think that we have till June 15th to pass. And I just was looking at your guidance as far as when you wanted to. We, we talked about some things where it's always an evolution, especially as it relates to the education, where we might have some more information the longer out we go, but maybe there's a risk in going out longer too. So I'm just wondering about your thinking about sort of passing the budget, whether or not to sort of I don't want to say delay, but hold off maybe is a better word for a little longer as we continue to get information. Maybe we get better savings from this year's school budget that we can allocate, right? There's a lot of good things there too. Didn't know what you're thinking was there. I, I've definitely been considering it. You know, I'm not going to ask you guys all to raise your hands right now to say who wants to get this budget all the way to June 15th. Right, uh, I don't <laughs> put that on you. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, I'll be lying if I didn't say, you know, I'm, I'm looking out for any type of guidance from the state as it may uh, pertain to uh, budget forecasting for us for next year. Um, you're, you're spot on. There may be some issues with um, a uh, fuel saving or summer school, summer schools canceled. Uh, people have to, you know, and there's no travel. Uh, all the way to, I don't think we would get any guidance on fall sports at all. Um, but, you know, I, I think maybe if we can look a little bit deeper at what we might be able to save, knowing that if we are in the similar uh, predicament we are in now, uh, come next year, that maybe we could realize a couple more savings that we're not realizing right now. Uh, obviously, I know that is difficult to do because if it does not materialize, then, you know, we are in a hole um, and I don't budget anything in a hole. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a conversation we may have to have. I, you know, I'd like to get uh, uh, at a later point, Mike O'Neill and Gary Evans and, and Mr. Uh, Emmett and Kazaka's uh, input into that on whether or not they would be willing to put off for another, you know, two, three weeks um, to get a better understanding or a better, you know, grasp on what may be out there. It may be that we're just faced with what the reality is right now is going to be the reality we, we see come um, June 15th. Um, I think having looked at, let's see, deliberations will be on the 19th and 21st. The phase one opening of the state is on the 20th maybe we might be able to see some guidance either pro or con after the 20th. And then we would have exactly one week um, to figure out, you know, if we want to go forward or not. Um, but I think with everything else that's going on right now, I think it's a, it's a day to day, um, you know, decision that has to be made. But 
I just wanted to follow up on that. Another big thing that I think we might be able to find out before June 15th, but maybe by the end of the month, it might fit within our regular schedule is the parks and rec. If the summer programs are going to run, if the pools will be permitted to be open, I think I would at least like to wait till the parks and rec information comes in. And I know there's some guidance coming out on the 15th. So maybe they'll make a decision shortly after that. So it might still fit within our time frame. But I do think I want to know what's going to happen with the summer parks and rec and the pools and stuff before we pass the budget. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, without any more comments, you know, I'll adjourn this uh, motion to adjourn the uh, May 13th uh, budget workshop with the Board of Ed. So moved. Second. Moved by Bello, seconded by Mazzarella. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those nay. Nobody keep it going. Go. <laughs> okay. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Guys. Thank you for your Good night, everyone. Nice Thank job, you. everybody. Thank nice you. job, Mayor. Good meeting.